people here obviously survived the banquet, uh, but uh, others uh, might come somewhat later. The first talk of the session will be given by John Ellis, and he will talk about glimpses of Susie, which give hope, but there's a question mark. Okay, please. Okay, thank you. Lefaisto, Calimera. So, uh, as I commented when I introduced the first speaker on the first day, uh, you know, hope springs eternal. And, uh, you know, maybe experiment is giving a, a two more reasons to uh, continue hoping for supersymmetry. And I'm referring to the measurement of G minus 2 and uh, the measurement of MW uh, by the CDF collaboration. So, uh, probably you've all seen this uh, picture before of the arrival at uh, Fermilab of the uh, magnet that was used previously by the Brookhaven experiment is now being used by the uh, Fermilab experiment. So uh, I'm not quite sure whether this is the dawn of a new era or the sunset of all our hopes. We'll come back to that in a moment. It's the clouds that <laughs> So uh, turns out that uh, I write papers, usually with Dimitri, on uh, G minus two about once every 20 years. So uh, this is uh, our first effort back in 1982. And uh, this is another one that we uh, wrote uh, about 20 years later when uh, the first Brookhaven result came out. Uh, so the sort of standard reference for the uh, standard model calculation of G minus two is of course provided by this uh, theory initiative review uh, that appeared in uh, 2020. So they gave a comprehensive review of all the QED calculations and also the uh, hadronic uncertainties, in particular those associated with the uh, hadronic vacuum polarization, uh, this uh, infamous diagram which you see down here. So uh, here is uh, just uh, one plot uh, taken from their paper. So uh, you see here that uh, the dominant contribution, hadronic contribution to G minus two comes from uh, energies below about a GeV. Uh, the uncertainty in the calculation is sort of a half below one GeV, a half between one and uh, two GeV. Uh, the, by contrast, high energy contribution is under good control from both experiment and uh, QCD. So anyway, here's uh, their estimate. Uh, the estimate uh, of the hydronic vacuum polarization contribution has uh, an uncertainty uh, below the percent level. Okay, so that uh, gives us this discrepancy between their standard model calculation and the experimental average. It's encouraging to note that the uh, Fermilab measurement agrees extremely well with the previous Brookhaven experiment. It's also encouraging that the statistical error, which is a, lar is a larger part of this error bar, and uh, so there's hope that uh, as the Fermilab experiment gets more data, then we'll get greatly increased precision in at least the experimental uh, measurement. Okay, so uh, when the Fermilab result came out, there was uh, a rush of papers, and uh, for a month or so I tried to keep track, uh, and I... Uh, color-coded the papers according to the theoretical interpretation, and uh, green is a color of hope, and as you can see here, there's a whole bunch of uh, supersymmetry papers. Okay, let me just uh, remind you briefly uh, what are the key elements in this calculation at the one-loop level. So uh, you've got uh, diagrams which involve neutralinos and uh, smuons, or charginos and uh, sneutrinos. If you're thinking about the neutralino smuon diagram, uh, you have to deal with the fact that there's actually four different neutralinos and there's two different smuons and they mix. And uh, actually the most important contribution, generally speaking, is one which involves the mixing between the left and the right smuon. And we'll come back to that later on. Okay, so uh, what can one do in supersymmetry? Well, of course, for a long time, the sort of uh, default uh, supersymmetric scenario was the CMSSM, where you assume universality of soft supersymmetry breaking at some high scale. 
And uh, in that case, you're totally screwed. Basically, because the smuon, here's the mass of the smuon right, uh, has to be very large when you take into account all the constraints coming from the LHC. So uh, this is actually largely based on a calculation that we did in 2017. Uh, we tried updating it in 2021, but we never actually quite succeeded. So this reference here is a little bit uh, out of date, but never mind. <laughs> Anyway, so the, the smuon is very heavy. The neutralino could be as light as a few hundred GV. But because of the heavy smuon, you can only get a very small contribution to G minus 2 from the CMSSM. And the uh, sort of standard theory calculation would require something way over here somewhere. And uh, here you see for the first time uh, the magic words BMW. Uh, I'll come back to BMW a little bit later. So you may be wondering whether, you know, with all the heroic efforts of the LHC experiments, some of which we heard about earlier on in this uh, meeting, whether there is still scope to have a relatively light smuon and or neutralino. And uh, so these are the uh, latest uh, plots that have been presented during the course of this meeting. Uh, so, so let's just look at the one on the right for the, for the time being. So what you see here is that uh, actually you could go down to, for the mass of the smuon, down to uh, 100 GeV, or even a little bit less, where you get a constraint coming from an old LEP experiment. Just one point I would like to make here. Uh, in, in most models, the selectron and the smuon are almost degenerate, but the right-handed smuon and the left-handed smuon may not be degenerate. And so the most relevant constraint of all these here in that class of model is the one on the right-handed uh, selectron, because that's the one that should be degenerate with a lighter smion. So uh, over here on the left, uh, in addition to uh, reproducing the experimental constraints, they've also uh, thoughtfully included uh, some of the uh, masses that could give you G minus 2 uh, under various different uh, hypotheses. So you can see that there is this uh, channel which is allowed where you could indeed get, uh, and it could explain the discrepancy between the standard standard model calculation and the experimental measurement. Uh, as an example of this, this is uh, from a paper that we actually did get out in 2017, where you see that you can accommodate the G minus 2 result. Uh, at that time, of course, it was just the Brookhaven result, but as I showed you, uh, the Fermilab result is essentially identical. Uh, you would need a smuon, which weighed about uh, 300 GeV or 400 GeV, and a neutralino, which is a little bit lighter. Absolutely no incompatibility with the LHC constraints, and uh, you know, a very big carrot uh, dangled in front of our experimental friends to work just a little bit harder to try to explore this channel of uh, low smuon and uh, low neutralino masses. Okay, so uh, here I just show a, a couple of plots uh, that came out uh, after the uh, uh, Brookhaven measurement from uh, Sven and collaborators. And uh, on the left, uh, they show a scatter plot of charge geno mass versus neutralino mass. On the right, it's slept on mass versus neutralino mass. A uh, whole bunch of uh, sample points in parameter space. Uh, the good ones are the ones here which are red stars, which uh, fit G minus 2, get the right relic density, cut all with the direct dark matter scattering and all the LHC constraints. Okay, now... BMW. So here you see uh, calculations based on uh, measurements of the hadronic vacuum polarization. And uh, here you see the uh, Brookhaven measurement. As I said, the Fermilab measurement largely overlaps. Here you see a bunch of lattice calculations with relatively large error bars. And you see this one, BMW, small error bar comparable with the hadronic vacuum polarization uh, error bar 
but a, a very different central value. And I, I'm not an expert on the lattice. I'm not going to go into it in detail. Uh, here's some, just some plots on how they... I mean, they have to do some extrapolation. They've got very good lattice data, but they have to do some extrapolation. You have to uh, understand the details and believe the details of that extrapolation. But uh, anyway, if you do that, then you find that the discrepancy with the experiment is much reduced compared with the uh, conventional hadron vacuum polarization calculation. Although, you know, it's still off by, you know, one and a half sigma, but I don't think we care these days about one and a half sigma. Okay. So, uh, my own personal work on this subject has been in the context of the uh, flipped SU5 uh, gut. So, so, we saw in the CMSSM, which is basically uh, you know, akin to supersymmetric regular SU5, that you cannot explain G minus uh, 2. With a phenomenological model where you allow the supersymmetric breaking masses to float uh, basically any way you want, you can explain G minus 2. What happens if you tie just one hand behind your back and you have this flipped SU5 model, which has a few more parameters than the CMSSM or regular SU5? So you get extra parameters because you've got a, an additional U1 factor. So you've got two different gauge masses, which frees up, to some extent, the mass of the neutralino. And the uh, right-handed uh, electron and muon are sitting in singlet representations of SU5. And so their soft supersymmetry breaking mass could be different from that of the uh, other sleptons and squarks. So in this model, you could have small masses for the lightest neutralino and the lightest muon. And uh, this shows you what we uh, found when we did an analysis in flipped SU5. So uh, here we've got uh, the LHC constraints. Here we've got the left lower limit. Up there, the lightest supersymmetric particle will be charged. So that's you know, really bad karma. Uh, the yellow points are the ones where we get you know, a relatively substantial contribution to G minus 2. So these are in the sort of uh, vacant channel that uh, we were looking at previously. And uh, this is actually our best fit point. And I checked that best fit point is still compatible uh, with the uh, very latest LHC constraints. So in this model, you can get halfway there, but not all the way. So this is uh, the discrepancy with the data-driven hydronic vacuum polarization calculation. Here's a discrepancy with BMW. Here's the CMSM. Here's flipped SU5. Flipped SU5 could certainly accommodate BMW. And uh, you know, if you really, really, really try very hard, you can even get as far as the data-driven value. So all very nice. But you know, for a year or so, I think people uh, sort of waited to see whether the BMW lattice calculation would be confirmed by other lattice calculations. And the bad news is, Yes, it has been confirmed. And uh, so there was uh, this paper by Che et al., uh, which uh, appeared, uh, yes, it's still this month. And uh, that's this little uh, green point here, which uh, basically coincides with the BMW calculation. And I should say it's not a complete calculation. Uh, what they do is a so-called window calculation where you look at some region of the uh, integral contributing to uh, G minus 2 where you think that the lattice is best equipped to provide an accurate calculation and uh, in that window uh, BMW is basically confirmed by uh, Che et al. And uh, if that wasn't bad enough uh, there was a, a conference recently in the US, the Schrigger Fest where other lattice groups presented their results, and a lot of them also seem to be quite compatible with uh, BMW and not so compatible with RBC, which was uh, the previous most accurate uh, lattice calculation. So, so clearly there are issues here, like you know, how do you reconcile these different uh, calculations with relatively small error bars? 
Uh, but, you know, it could very well be that uh, there is still an anomaly in the anomalous magnetic moment, but it may well be a smaller anomaly than uh, what we thought when the uh, Fermilab result came out. So, uh, just to finish off on this topic, uh, this uh, horrible table uh, gives you uh, the spectrum that we get in our best fit uh, flipped SU5 model. And uh, so uh, the smuon is light, the neutralino is light, so opportunities to look for them at the LHC. Other supersymmetric particles are heavy, and uh, we get the right relic density uh, right on the nose, basically without even trying. We didn't have to adjust parameters to get the right relic density. Uh, and that's a, a common feature that's been found in other calculations, that if you're in that channel, then you can easily get uh, the right relic density. Okay. Now, uh, MW. So uh, this plot here compares the uh, CDF measurement of MW uh, with its uh, stated errors, and it's confronted here with previous experimental measurements uh, from LEP and uh, the LHC, and also D0 measurement. And uh, over here we have standard model calculations. So, on the one hand, there's a 7.2 standard deviation discrepancy with the standard model value prediction. Uh, on the other hand, there's also quite some tension with the previous experimental measurements. So I think uh, the tension with the other experimental measurements also, is also something that, that needs to be understood. Uh, anyway, if you just average the previous measurements, that gives you this uh, gray error bar here, uh, then what you can do is naively combine that with CDF, uh, and you get this black point here. Uh, probably you shouldn't be so naive. Probably you should uh, expand the error bars according to uh, the uh, PDG prescription when you've got uh, mutually incompatible measurements. But it's not going to change very much what I'm going to be saying later on. Okay, so, so let's look a little bit uh, more at the uh, CDF uh, measurement. So if you look down their uh, table of uncertainties here, I've uh, highlighted for you uh, the principal uncertainties which one has to look at uh, in order to assess uh, whether one should take this measurement at face value. So just to remind you, uh, you know, the, the way you measure the mass of the W is you, you measure a lepton and uh, then you sort of go from that to the actual mass of the parent uh, boson. So you need to have a, a good measurement of the lepton energy scale. That's one of the principal uncertainties. Uh, you also need to have a model for how the W is produced and uh, that is also one of the relatively large uncertainties. And uh, the calculation uh, is also dependent on the distribution of the partons inside your protons or your antiprotons that collide to make your W. And that actually is the, uh, the largest uh, of all these uncertainties, apart from the uh, statistics. So there have been some questions about the uh, accuracy of uh, the muon momentum measurement. So I'm a theorist. I don't have any uh, dog in this particular fight, uh, but let me just show you uh, a couple of plots. So the top one here is uh, taken from the CDF uh, paper, and uh, the lower one is uh, taken from, I confess, a, a blog by uh, another experimentalist, uh, Tommaso Dorigo. So what CDF did was they extrapolated these measurements here of things like the J psi and the Upsilon uh, down to uh, higher, sorry, down to lower values of GeV over PT of the muon, in other words, to larger values of the muon. So their direct measurement of the uncertainty coming from the measurement of the Z is uh, not so accurate. So what Tommaso did was to say, well, you know, what we really are interested in, in these, is in these relatively high uh, PT measurements. 
And if he fits those, then he gets a larger uncertainty in a different central value. So well, I, I'm sure that CDF has an answer to this, but uh, I don't know what it is. So, so the next uncertainty uh, was uh, the uh, modeling of the uh, W and Z production. So for this, CDF uh, used a code called Resbos, but they used a version of Resbos uh, which uh, is about 20 years old. I mean, they sort of fixed it up somewhat, but still, it's a relatively old code. Uh, so there's a new version of Resbos, which uh, includes more higher act order uh, perturbative QCD calculations, and there are other QCD calculations that aren't included in Resbos version 2. So it would be nice if in the future the modeling of W and Z involved the latest QCD calculations. <coughs> now, uh, in their paper, CDF looked at uh, a relatively restricted range of parton distributions. Other people have looked at a larger selection of parton distribution functions, and uh, they actually estimate a, a larger uncertainty than what is uh, claimed by CDF in their paper. So all that is to say, I don't know. Uh, some people say that the uncertainty in the CDF measurement might be significant large, significantly larger than what they claim, but I'm going to take it at face value for the rest of this talk. Uh, not just me. 90 other groups of theorists have also taken it at face value, and uh, hope springs eternal, so there's a bunch of supersymmetric interpretations as well. So... Uh, Initially, I, I'm not going to use supersymmetry. I'm going to use a very general approach, the standard model effective field theory, where you add in to the standard model calculation dimension six operators uh, with coefficients, which you then uh, constrain by a global fit to all the available data. And uh, that, I think, is you know, the most effective, efficient way to extract possible information about physics beyond the standard model. So here is a sort of a catalog of all the dimension six operators <coughs> that we include in our uh, global fit. I'm not going to go through them in, in great detail. Uh, there's a, a few of them that uh, could potentially contribute to MW, and uh, I've uh, highlighted them here. Uh, but you can't just put in whatever value you, you like for those operators because they're also constrained by other data. Those operators contribute to uh, electroweak position observables, Higgs production, uh, TT bar observables, and so on. So if you want to see how large a contribution you could get to MW from those dimension six operators, you have to do a global fit, and that's what we did. And uh, here we confirm that if you do a global fit with a new value of MW, then uh, each of those operators individually could make a significant contribution and its coefficient is pulled away from zero. Whereas if you took the previous measurements of MW, there was no pull away from zero. Okay, now where might those operator coefficients come from? Well, they could come from the uh, tree-level exchanges of massive particles. So we considered all possible single field extensions of the standard model. Uh, some of them are scalars, some of them are vectors, and the rest are fermions. Then we identified which of those could uh, make a, this sort of tree level contribution uh, through the dimension six operator. And so a bunch of them could in principle. However, a bunch of them, instead of increasing MW, decrease MW. So you can cross those out. And uh, here there are a few which would have the right sign and could potentially increase MW. And uh, here are uh, the sort of ranges of masses that you would uh, need for those single field extensions if you assume that they have uh, unit couplings to standard model particles. Probably they don't, uh, but the uh, estimate of the mass goes linearly with the magnitude of the coupling. So if you think, for example, the coupling is uh, 0.3, then you would decrease the mass by a factor of three. But we're talking about masses in the TeV range. So uh, two of these possible single field extensions involve vector bosons. 
Uh, one involves uh, an isotriplet uh, scalar, and a couple involve singlet fermions, either a neutrino-like uh, fermion or a uh, selectron stroke smion-like uh, fermion. A and some of these can be found in principle at the LHC, others look much more difficult. So, since I'm now on zero, uh, what can one do with supersymmetry? So just before the measurement came out, uh, there was a paper by uh, Banyaski et al, where they analyzed the possible contributions of light electroweak particles. And uh, there's a, a cloud of possibilities here, which could take you up to the previous world average, but not to the new world average and not to the CDF measurement. But it could, in principle, also be a contribution from stops, which they did not include in that. And uh, here is a previous calculation uh, of the uh, stop contribution. And if you put the two together, then you get that green arrow sitting on top of this electroweak smear here, and you could reach the new world average. So supersymmetry could make a significant contribution to MW, but uh, not enough to explain the CDF measurement by itself, but enough to explain the new world average. So, last slide. People often ask me, well, you know, what lies beyond the standard model? So, I still say supersymmetry is the best scenario. Uh, you've got new motivations from LHC uh, runs one and two, and maybe G minus two and or MW is also providing us with a glimpse of supersymmetry. Thank you. I believe these two topics are actually somewhat uh, related because when you believe that the vacuum polarization, hadronic vacuum polarization is bigger than previously thought, I believe this makes the discrepancy in MW somewhat bigger, isn't it? The standard model prediction of MW goes down a little bit if you increase the vacuum polarization to yeah, so the, accommodate the, G minus 2 better. Yeah, so there's been some analysis of that. I think. Uh, Peter Athron and collaborators in particular came out with a paper shortly after the uh, CDF measurement making precisely this point. I, I, and, I, and I'm not going to argue that it's the same type of supersymmetry which could do both. Could you go back to the Dirigo plot, please, Jim? Uh, Uh, okay, so how much difference in the measured MW does this, does this make, this different extrapolation? Okay, so it, it would be a difference between, you know, 1.4 per mil and, no, 1.3 per mil. So that's a tenth of a per mil. So that's 10 to the minus 4. Uh, 10 to the minus 4 of... Uh, that, that's like 8 MeV, something like that. Okay, so n not enough, but all these things seem to be about, all these effects, the PDF and so on, they all seem to be about, you know, 10-ish MeV, right? Yeah, so I, I didn't explicitly comment. So there's been an analysis by experts in electric uh, analyses who say that going from Resbos version 1 to Resbos version 2 is probably the order of 10 or 15 MeV. Thanks. I, and that was also... Coincidentally, the sort of order of magnitude of PDF uncertainty that was claimed in this paper here. And there have been other papers that I didn't have here which also uh, point to similar uncertainties coming from PDFs but different aspects of the PDF fit. Carlos is being very patient. <laughs> You've given up? Hi. Uh, yeah, very nice talk. Actually, I have a question, but on that comment, I saw that paper, and I, I, had, I wasn't sure if they included differences to the spin correlation effects. I saw there were next to leading order corrections, uh, NNLO corrections, but maybe not the spin ones. So I don't know if that would have an important effect. 
So you, you're talking about... Uh, yeah, for uh, yeah, response I, two. But, okay, that wasn't my question. My question was I was, I was very interested when you showed the, uh, for the W mass, the um, uh, EFT, the, the new operators that were relevant here but were constrained by other things, and it included TTV. And in general, we've seen that Atlas and CMS both measure a bit of an excess in TTW. Though, okay, the uncertainties aren't that large, and there was a nice talk by Victor yesterday on top uh, measurements at CMS that showed maybe with the latest uh, generators and corrections, they're getting a little closer. But ha have you, you know, ha have you studied those at, at all, or do you think those might be significant? And, and could these operators also contribute to uh, excess TTW events? Yeah. So, so we haven't done so uh, yet. So, so, so this analysis uh, that uh, I just presented to you uh, was largely based on uh, the data set that we had uh, in this paper that we wrote a, a couple of, no, a year and a half ago. Okay. And, and we have it you know, planned to do an update of that. I think we're waiting until we get all the iChip results and then we'll you know, throw everything in and then we'll see uh, uh, what the picture looks like. Ca Carlos, you're itching. You're, you're, you're sort of hesitating. No, 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 no. <laughs> I give you my, my right to ask the question you want. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so in one of in the G minus two in one of your slides you had um, the an analysis made with the PMSSM eleven. Has it been done for the full PMSSM? Well, uh, n not in the way that we would like to do such an analysis, uh, because the full PMSSM you've got you know, many more parameters, and uh, to sample those parameters in a meaningful way, I, I think, is computationally uh, too much. It's just been, uh, so maybe we could do the PMSSM 12, okay, but PSSM 20, I don't think so. I mean, ju ju just think about it, right? I mean, if you want to sample, you know, at the 10% at the level, e each of the possible 20 values, right, that's 10 to the 20 points. Mm. Right. So of course you, you do smart sampling, so it's not really 10 to the 20, but it is a hell of a lot if you want to do it properly. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Good morning, and uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk about one of my favorite subjects, namely um, new Higgs bosons around the corner. And I said, well, the laser is the big one, I guess, yeah? Yeah. With Susie and without Susie, and we will see where we stand. I will talk about some hints that uh, appeared at 400 GV. I will talk at some hints that uh, were there for quite some time at 95 GV. And uh, I hope to keep the tension here by naming the, 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 the fourth topic here, the third axis at the same mass, which I think is very promising. To start with, we have discovered a standard model like Higgs boson. Standard model cannot be the ultimate theory. We are all aware of that. Only possible conclusion, the standard model, uh, the Higgs that we've seen can't be the Higgs of the standard model. This is impossible. But of course, the real question that we want to ask is, does the BSM physics that must exist has any relevant impact on the Higgs? Are there any hints from the LHC? And if so, which model may fit these? And the answer, how can we answer this? Of course, we can uh, check for the changed properties of the Higgs discovered at 125 GV. I'll not talk about this. I'll talk about the check for additional Higgs bosons, and I write here above and below 125 GV. Maybe I should say this before, when you think, ah, everything below 125 GV has been ruled out by LEP and by the LHC or so, 
this is clearly not true, and you will see where these uh, points are lying. I will talk about two models where I will do the interpretation. First, the non susie model, which is the next to 2 x double model, the N2HDM, which has nearly the uh, Higgs structure of the NMSSM. We have two X doublets and one real singlet here, the Higgs potential. We have uh, the normal Z2 symmetry that prevents the flavor change in neutral currents at tree level. And we have an additional Z2 symmetry that forbids some other terms, but it's broken by the weft of the singlet. Important for us here are the physical states. We have three CP even ones, one CP odd, and the pair of charged. So with respect to the uh, two HDM, just one CP even Higgs boson more. As I said, we have the normal Z2 symmetry. We have these four types. I'll come back to this later. I assume that this is more or less known how this works. This works here exactly as in the 2HDM. And for the CP even Higgs bosons, we have to rotate to the physical basis. We have here this uh, matrix that will appear later on, a three by three matrix governed by three mixing angles. And the physical input parameters that we are using are these three mixing angles, the usual tension beta, the ratio of the two VEFs, the VEF of the standard model effectively, the VEF of the singlet, all the masses, and this uh, parameter M12 squared that breaks softly the first uh, two symmetry. Now, the second model that I will talk about is then the NMSSM, or the Z3 invariant NMSSM. This here is the uh, Higgs sector of the uh, MSSM and the Higgs potential, and in the NMSSM, we add then here again this singlet, so it's similar to the previous model, but now it's a complex singlet. We get these additional terms, and uh, I just listed here the uh, input parameters of the Higgs sector. In the MSSM, we would have only the charge Higgs and 10 beta, and now we have here four more free parameters. Good. The Higgs spectrum, of course, again, three CP even ones, now two CP odd ones, the charge, the Goldstones, and the uh, neutralino sector is extended by one singlino. I come to the axis at uh, 400 GeV. Well, actually, I will talk about one axis at 400 GV. When we wrote the paper, there were two axes. One has disappeared by now. Uh, this is the one that uh, survives and is actually the nicer one, in my opinion. It appears in the CMS Higgs boson searches where they look at the decay for, uh, to TT bar. So these are the diagrams that contribute. And the interference of signal and background uh, gives you in this uh, MTT distribution gives you this uh, kind of uh, peak dip structure, and this is exactly what CMS observed here. And one can also put this into the plane of the A boson mass, if you think it's a CP or Higgs boson, and this is the coupling constant of the A to TT bar. Um, this is the expected limit that they hope to find with the one and two sigma uncertainties, and this is the observed limit. And you can see that there here is this discrepancy, most prominently at 400 GeV. Uh, the local axis is three and a half sigma. The global one is a little bit less than two. And this was the hardest part of the project to get this kind of chi-square contribution from CMS. It took us about a year. Uh, one can see here the chi-square contribution that one gets uh, depending on the coupling of the A to TT bar and depending on the width of the A boson. Yeah? And here there are st this, this largest axis and with respect to the standard model, which is here, we have a chi-square contribution of 14. In a moment, I will show you results where we not only look at this one, but of course, we also have to fit the standard model like Higgs at 125 GV. So the total chi-square will be composed out of these two, yeah? the one from, one, from the 125 GV Higgs, uh, based on all the LHC rate measurements where we use our code Higgs signals, plus this one from the TT bar. So, question, can this axis be accommodated in the end to HDM? You can anticipate the answer already. <laughs> Um, we did a parameter scan. I'll not go into details here, just to show you that we tried to be extensive. And uh, of course, we tried to, well, we did include all the relevant constraints. I again will not go into details, tree level perturbativity, that the potential is really the minimum one or at least long lived, all the Higgs searches, uh, the uh, properties, as I said, from this uh, 125 GV Higgs boson, flavor physics, and electric precision data. This is the result of our parameter scan. This is again the coupling ATT bar. This is tangent beta. And uh, here we have several best fit values depending on the width of the A boson. These are the points. This is our best fit point. Main message, yes, indeed, the model can accommodate this axis relatively easily, as we will see, for low 10 beta. Yeah, here in this range, for low 10 beta, the agreement is quite good. 
So this works. I have a few more plots on this. If one puts it into this plot that the CMS presented, we would live right here. I mean, 400 is chosen by hand, and then these are the points that we find, and you can see that this nicely uh, explains the axis that they've seen. Uh, how can we test this scenario? For example, by measuring the couplings of the 105 GB Higgs boson. Mm, here I show the uh, plane of the coupling of this 125 GB Higgs boson to uh, gauge bosons versus B quarks. The color scale in, uh, shows us 10 beta, so look only at the dark points. Forget about the light points. They came from the other axis that I'll not discuss here. Uh, so these are the dark points. This here are the, anticip the anticipated precision of the Hilumi LHC. And this small ellipse here is if you add in the uh, measurement of uh, the ILC 250, potential 250 GV E plus E minus collider. And one can see that um, most points would give you a very large deviation, but of course the standard model, which is the center of these ellipses here, could also be realized and we wouldn't see anything. But most of the points that give you the axis are indeed, uh, would indeed give you a large deviation. Same holds if you look here for, uh, for the coupling to TT bar. Um, here, I, I, maybe I didn't say it was on the slides. We focus right now on type 2. This is correct. Sorry. I should have said it. Yes, you're absolutely right. Um, next question. Can the model be accommodated or can the axis be accommodated in the N2HDM? Uh, in the NMSSM, sorry. And uh, we go to the alignment limit. Again, we do a parameter scan. This, of course, is the Higgs sector of our model. And uh, yes, we found that also this model can do it, although not as nicely as the N2HDM. We have less freedom. Uh, while this is the N2HDM solution, this is the NMSSM solution. You may wonder why do the points lie directly below this line here. This is accidental. Yeah? There's nothing to it. It's just uh, what we found could be accommodated. Yeah? So we get smaller couplings of the CPO at Higgs boson to TT bar. But as one can see here, the chi square contribution, chi, chi square TT bar, in the N2HDM is effectively zero. Here we are at units of five to six, whereas in the standard model we have 14. It's not a perfect fit, but it substantially improves the agreement with the experimental data. And uh, why can't we go to higher values? The reason is the search for the charged Higgs bosons, which I saw on the right-hand side here. These are, again, our points, but um, there was no access for the search of charged Higgs bosons. In fact, they set a stronger limit than that expected. So here, this is the expected limit, and this is the observed limit, and our points live below. If they had observed, if they had gone to the expected limit, then we could also live here at higher values. On the other hand, this was the previous search uh, from CMS for charged Higgs bosons. Uh, this is the current version or the current result. And uh, the improvement with more luminosity, this was here first year run two, this is uh, full run two data. The improvement was rather moderate. So they didn't go in the direction of excluding more than they expected. Therefore, I think this looks still very promising. Again, can we test this uh, at future colliders? Yes, again, we could look at the couplings of the 135 GPX bosons to gauge bosons and to BB bar. These are our points. High Lumi LHC will not be good enough. We need a plus or minus machine, but the plus or minus machine would clearly see a strong deviation from the standard model. Good. I come to the uh, accesses at 95 GV, and I will start with the axes that have been around for quite some time. This is our summary plot that uh, shows the results for the searches for light Higgs bosons at the LHC. Uh, so PP going to Higgs decaying to two photons. And I'll try to walk you through this plot where we summarize the results. This is the Higgs boson mass. This is the excluded cross-section normalized to the standard model. So this is the standard model line. Red is CMS. Blue is Atlas. Uh, dashed is the expected limit. And solid is the observed limit. So one can see the expected limit here goes up because here's the Z boson sitting. You have larger background. Therefore, the limits become weaker. Uh, and then this is flat. The observed limit from CMS, on the other hand, this is based on the first year run two plus the run one data, uh, goes up as expected, goes down, and then has this peak here uh, where actually the axis is sitting. And they get a mu value, so the ratio of production uh, cross-section times branching ratio divided by the standard model expectation for Higgs at this mass, which is 0.6 plus minus 0.2 corresponding to a th three sigma axis. Now, normally the other experiment excludes this kind of uh, 
uh, hints for new Higgs bosons or BSM physics. Therefore, one has to look at ATLAS. And um, this is the ATLAS expectation. So they could cut into this region here. The ATLAS expectation is based on 18 inverse Hamptobahn of two data, so more than twice as what CMS has been using. And still, their sensitivity is much lower, which is because they have a worse control of the background. You can ask your details later. What is ATLAS observing? As I said, they could cut into the preferred region. They see the Z peak here, and then they see this, I would say, shoulder-like structure, something like one sigma. They could exclude it partially, but they don't. Yeah? And how I like to phrase it, if there is something, it would look exactly like this. On the other hand, we know that the reverse doesn't hold. Yeah? If it looks like this, it doesn't mean that there is something. Yeah? But if there is something, it would look exactly like this. Then for the uh, more senior people among us, yeah, you remember the lab axis at 98 GV, um, coming from the production in, in Higgs-Strahlung at the decay to BB bar. There's one axis at 98 GV, but it's in the BB bar channel, so it's rather broad and also perfectly compatible with 95 GV, where, <coughs> so this is sitting here, where they observed this two sigma axis um, the new value 0.12 plus minus 0 0.06. And of course, since we have two axes at the same mass, the question is, can they be accommodated together in a model? So what do we need to fit this? Uh, of course, we have need, well, we go to the um, N2HDM. Uh, we put one Higgs boson at 95 GV. We put, of course, one Higgs boson at 120, so 95 and 125 GV. In order to um, get the right rate for the lab axis, we have to reduce the couplings to gauge bosons. On the other hand, we get, have to get a large uh, decay to photons. How do we do this? It's very difficult to get a larger decay by new particles in the loop. What you have to do is you have to reduce the main other decay channel, which is BB bar. So we need to reduce rate to BB bar to enhance the branching ratio to photons. On the other hand, the coupling to TT bar should not be reduced in order to accommodate this. What is more or less free still is the coupling to tau. It can be reduced or enhanced. Then one looks at these four types. This is this R matrix that I was mentioning before. And then there are these factors uh, with uh, sine beta. And if one says, for example, we need this uh, reduced uh, to enhance this, uh, this can be done in the various models. But if one looks well, if you want to reduce BB bar but not TT bar, this immediately rules out type 1 and type 3, yeah, because they go together. You can't suppress the one and not suppress the other. So type 2 and type 4 survive, and they differ by their couplings to taus. Yeah? Uh, they can be either enhanced or suppressed at the same time. So they can both do it, but it's nice that type 2, which corresponds to SUSY, as we know, is one of the candidates here. But as I said, they can be distinguished via those couplings to taus. And if one uh, does a parameter scan, this is the uh, gamma gamma new value, this is the lab, the BV bar new value, uh, these are the parameter points that we scan, this is the one sigma ellipse. Uh, you, we see many, many points here, the color coding tells you how well the 125 GV Higgs boson fits uh, to the LHC data, so dark colors are good, we see relatively dark colors also here, this is our best fit point, and it's clear that the axes, the two axes can be accommodated at the same time. The main challenge, or you may ask, which model can do the two axes, or the, the two masses together, the 400 GV and the 95 GV, and uh, we tried this, of course. This is the result in the uh, N2HDM, in the mu CMS, or mu gamma gamma, mu BB value, um, this, now the color coding tells you how well is the TT bar axis at 400 GV fitted. Again, dark colors are very good. These are the points that we find, and we see, yes, the N2HDM has enough freedom to accommodate these two types of axes. It doesn't look as good in the NMSSM shown on the right-hand side here. These are the points that we find, and we can see that, yes, the gamma gamma axis at the CMS can be accommodated, whereas the BB bar at the same time cannot. The structure of the Higgs sector is so rigid that it correlates these two quite strongly, and you can't get one large and the other one also large. Yeah, this is not possible. But still, if uh, we say, yeah, maybe lab only two sigma, we throw this away, then also the MSSM is a very good candidate here. Now, the last point that I want to make, the third axis at the same mass, we have seen two axes, yeah, these are just the two plots that I've shown to you before. 
Very recently, CMS presented a new analysis, and they searched for Higgs bosons in the decay to two taus. And the question when you see this plot, can you spot the axis? And people say, yes, of course, there is the one, but can you see it also at 95 to 100 GV? And it, it's, it's hard to see, but actually at 100 GV, it's uh, three sigma, and uh, at 95, it's 2.5 sigma, something like this. Better visible in this plot, that's also from uh, CMS, where they show cross-section gluon fusion, the K to tau, and this is uh, the cross-section for BB bar, Higgs, Higgs to tau tau. Uh, if you don't see anything, the best fit should be here at zero, zero, but indeed they see this as the best fit point, and you can see here clearly the three sigma deviation that they see. And I think it's quite intriguing that we have effectively three axes in the light Higgs boson searches at the same mass. So, um, my slightly provocative slide, these are the three mu values, these are the uh, sigmas that we find. Since we have three axes at the same mass, we can throw away the look elsewhere effect, we don't have to care about this anymore, and we can combine these. And I don't get quite to five, but if you do this, you get at something like 4.3 sigma, which I think looks interesting. Now the question, can we fit all three axes together? And uh, of course, we tried the N to HDM, and now we looked at type two and type four, and unfortunately, because of the enhancement and the decreased structure of the couplings, in type 2, we find these points here. So, and this is the uh, one sigma ellipse in gamma gamma and tau tau. We don't find points that can accommodate both. We can do gamma gamma, we can do tau tau, but not the two of them together. On the other hand, type 4 gives us these points, and we are very close, so type, uh, type 4 does a very good job here. Um, the, uh, this is just the other uh, overview here, gamma gamma versus tau tau, this works, and this is BB bar with tau tau, which also works. Yeah, just to show this, no problem at all. The color coding now tells us again how well the 125G Higgs is fitted, and again, no problem here. Um, I want to say, this is the analysis in the end to HDM. Uh, tomorrow in the parallel sessions, there will be a talk by Cheng Li from DAISY, who looks at the same thing in the 2HDMS and gives more details about it. This is the overview where we show, the, again, these three axes. This is the gamma-gamma axis. Yeah, this is here. Uh, and we can see that our points that we find are in perfect agreement with the mu value that they give out. This is the tau-tau uh, axis. We are not maybe, we don't go above, but uh, we are slightly below, still very good. And the lab axis is also quite well fitted over here. Connection to the W boson mass. Can we also get the W boson mass out? In this model, if we want to explain the axis, we had to do another scan because before, of course, we tried to get a small uh, t-parameter, the contribution to the W boson mass, but you can also get a larger one. Effectively, what you do is you change only the heavy Higgs boson part, yeah, which is more or less independent of the light Higgs boson part. And um, this is the plain W boson mass versus effective weak mixing angle. Uh, this here is the standard model. Uh, this here, these ellipses show you the two different measurements for the effective weak mixing angle, one coming from SLD, this one, this here is the one from LEP, and this is the world, the so far world average. Uh, you can see the standard model is only in agreement if you take the average of these two, this is long-standing three sigma discrepancy. Now, if we go to our model and we try to fit all the axes, but also fit the W boson mass, which is indicated by this uh, vertical line here, we can do this, these are the points, perfect. But it's then known, if you do it via the T parameter, you move down, well, you move up in the W boson mass, you move down in the effective weak mixing angle, and then only the uh, SLD measurement would be uh, in agreement. And then one has to think, well, what happened to lab here, but this is the situation. But this kind of prob problem you find in nearly all the explanations that have been put out after the W boson mass measurement came out. What can we do about it in the future? Um, this is a plot that shows the uh, uh, limits that come, the, oh, how to say, this is the light Higgs boson mass. This here is the coupling of the light Higgs to gauge bosons squared times the branching ratio to BB bar. This, this uh, blue line corresponds to the lab exclusion limit. This dotted line is the lab expected limit. This is this two sigma axis. And then in our model type four, we are sitting here with our points. This line indicates what can be done at the ILC 250, and uh, the ILC 250, of course, this is the lab expected, 
the lab uh, limit, we can go down here so we can uh, probe substantially smaller couplings. Uh, and all these points that explain the axes are indeed in the reach. So in the plus or minus collider at 250 GV will be able to produce this new Higgs boson abundantly. And this will then give us the opportunity to measure its characteristics, its couplings to a high precision. Uh, this is just what well, this is first a plot that shows the um, uh, couplings of the 125 GV Higgs bosons to tau plus, uh, tau minus versus gauge bosons. Type 4 is, are the red points here. This was type 2, but forget about this for the moment. This is type 4. This is the standard model point, again, with the high Lumi LHC ellipse and the ILC ellipse, and we would see a large deviation here. That is very nice. But, as I said, we can also attempt a coupling measurement of the new Higgs boson, because we can produce it there. This is shown via these red points here, coupling of the light Higgs boson to tau plus tau minus versus uh, uh, gauge bosons. Uh, these are our points, and these little green circles, which are indeed ellipses, they indicate the precision that we can expect from any plus or minus collider, and you can see that the couplings can be determined to a very high precision, which will allow us really to pin down the underlying parameters of the model with a nice precision. I come to my conclusions. The Higgs boson that we've discovered cannot be the standard model Higgs boson, so we have to search for additional ones above and below 125 GV. I focused on two models here, the N2HDM and the NMSSM. We looked at several axes, first the one at 400 GV from TT bar with the 3.5 sigma local, and then I discussed the three axes at the same mass in the diphoton di decay uh, from CMS, the BB bar axis uh, from LAB, and then the new one, tau plus, tau minus, also on CMS, and if you combine them naively, but uh, not too bad because they're independent, you get to 4.3 sigma. And this is the list of how we can fit these axes. For example, TT bar, you can get to can do it in both models, or in the N2 HDM in the two types. If you look at the uh, gamma gamma and P bar 95, you can also do it in both models without any problem. Then TT bar 400 GV, gamma gamma at 95 again in the two models. So Susie does a good job. but by adding more and more axes, it becomes more complicated. So if you add here, then BB bar, you only can do it in the N2HDM in the two types. And if you ask for the uh, three axes at 95, only the type 4 can do it. But this also shows us that by looking at these axes, who knows what will survive, this will allow us to discriminate the various models that ex can explain it. Yeah? So we will see what the future will bring us. And the last point, remember, not all of these anomalies have to survive. If one survives, we are in business and we are fine. Thanks. <laughs> okay, so you, you, very good talk, thank you. Um, so you probably mentioned, no, but what is Atlas doing about this, those exercises? You mentioned CMS, LEP. So can you comment uh, again? So. Atlas, let's start with the gamma-gamma axis. As I said, Atlas has this limit based on the 18 inverse Semtoban. I was told they're working on the rest of the data set, but it doesn't seem to have high priority for them. What they should do, improve their background estimates to improve the sensitivity. And the other problem is that you need uh, simulations for the background, and they just so far didn't put enough computational time into it. I don't know whether they're doing it. CMS, I know they're analyzing the rest of the data set, the two final years of run two, so something like three times, what, well, yeah, they will get to 140 inverse Semtoban from now 36 inverse Semtoban. And I, I'm sh not sure, but I think there are good chances that they will present these data uh, this year at some point, yeah? But they are working on it for quite some time already, and, okay. well, I think, if they see the axis again, the rest of the data, we are really in business. If they say nothing there, you can forget about it. But we will see. Experimental data will tell us. Here, yeah, so, Sven. So, you said that the standard model, the Higgs you have seen have, cannot be the standard model, and therefore there should be some misalignment that not very large. 
And in the NMSSM, you were sitting on alignment, I think, so you impose perfect alignment. Uh, how that, you know, in the other cases, I think you were trying to see how precision measurements from the 125 would fit. I didn't see that in the NMSSM since you already asked for alignment. So what is the freedom there? In the NMSSM? Yeah. Not sure how to answer this question. Um, we went to the alignment, or let's say nearly alignment limit, and then we did a parameter scan around it. So we have some contributions from the additional particles there. And I think I showed one plot. Uh, this one here, yeah? So we see very slight deviations coming from additional particles or so, but uh, I see, for example, here for the coupling to uh, gauge bosons, we are nearly at the center model value, very small deviation only, and for BB bar, it's in a few percent range, but, yeah. And, and so these light Higgs, uh, one... This yes. is the 125 GB Higgs boson, yeah? Yeah, here no, we but didn't... when you try to put the 100 GB uh, Higgs, so... Yes. So how much... Uh, mixture that it has with... Uh... Oh, normally we find uh, the singlet component of the light Higgs is at the 90%, 80-90% level, something like that. Okay, okay thank yeah, you. So this you need. Yeah, you need some doublet component to couple it yeah. to the standard model, yeah? Okay, very good. So, uh, indeed, some of these games were played at lab with CP violation with Marcel and Ellie. Uh, uh, so I, I have a simple question because most of these questions have been already asked. Uh, in the, for the 400 GV case, uh, do you need, uh, why you need a singlet? I mean, what happens if you have a 2 Higgs doublet model, a simple 2 Higgs doublet model? Uh, what is the, what yeah. prevents you from doing so that? So the reason why we looked at the models with a singlet was that we never planned to look at 400 alone. We wanted to do look at 400 plus 95. Ah. I only, pedagogically, I, I presented in a different way. Um, in the MSSM, I don't think you can do the 400 because we know that all the Higgses have to be very close in mass, and then the charge Higgs is also very low and contradicts. No, no, I'm, ge and I'm, I'm saying so uh, general. With the singlet, with the singlet, you have more freedom, and you can get also to, to the alignment limit or closer to the alignment limit for lower. Well, for, for somewhat larger masses there. Yeah, so in the NMSSM, this can be accommodated still. Yeah, okay, I understand the MSSM gives restrictions in the quartic couplings, but in the two Higgs double model, you have more freedom yeah. than the MSSM. So, of course, if you start playing with all these Higgses, uh, which you have to put them very light, okay, 95, 400 in this NMSSM, then you also have to worry about other constraints from, because the charge Higgs might be also light, you may have to worry also about other constraints like BS gamma, for example. Yes. But, and um, uh, I don't know whether you, this has been, that's my last question. <laughs> we took this into account. Okay. So this is, they're all, they're okay. What is the charge Higgs in your case? Uh, the charge Higgs mass is a bit higher. Um, I think we found it at 500 GV or so, but uh, in the paper there are plots about this. It goes from 500 and above. <laughs> What other decay modes does the 400 GV Higgs have? Where else do you find it directly rather than indirectly? Yes, so we also looked at this and um, the decay modes of this one, what do I? Of course, well, it has to go to TT bar, yeah, as we've seen, uh, which is the best uh, possibility. Of course, it also goes to BB bar or so, but um, there are not many possibilities. So I think TT bar is the real mode that you have to look for. Yeah, for the 400 GV. Um, we, in the NMSSM, we also looked at the case uh, where the other Higgs bosons are then sitting, and uh, there are possibilities to look for the heavier Higgs bosons as well. Yeah, but I skipped this here for the sake of time. But there are possibilities to discover them as well. Finally. <laughs> Excellent. So then regarding the 400 GV, excess, so yeah. could you show it again? So then that, yeah, this one. that one. So does it bother you that uh, the excess is just at the beginning of the spectrum where TTVR start to? So well, 400 GV is the first data point. 
But if one looks at this uh, peak dip structure that they were expecting and that they are seeing, and uh, they seem, well, I don't think they would have put it out if they weren't sure that they can go to 400 GeV. Atlas, I think, uh, is more yeah. hesitant. They started at somewhat higher masses. Yeah, that's, that's precisely my question. So yeah, then this is, this is okay. Uh, Very well, good. I'm a theorist. I'm not here to judge our experimental friends and tell no, them, no, I look, I don't that trust that your analysis. Yeah? you a little bit. Okay. <laughs> Well, this is, this is what they did, of course. This comes from the interference of these diagrams. Yeah? This is why you get the structure, and this is what they are seeing. Yeah, it's very strange because, you know, the, the continuum interference is uh, very bad. Uh, so it's very strange. So I don't believe in this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then take 95. <laughs> 95. <laughs> As he said, one is enough. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. Is there a microphone that I can carry with me, or do I have to speak here? I speak here. Okay. Um, yes, thank you very much, the organizers, for the kind invitation, and also thanks to the previous speaker for agreeing to um, to uh, speak earlier. Uh, hindsight advice: you know, if you, even if you do have a car, don't drive here; just take the bus. Um, um, right. So I'm going to be covering gravitational waves and the most recent results from the LIGO-Virgo collabora collaboration. The pointer here. Oh yes, thank you. It's this one. <clears throat> yeah. Right. So, uh, w oh, we do have a Thank you. Right. So, when, when, trying, when trying to put together the talk, I was starting to think, uh, you know, what, what uh, of our results, which uh, subset of our results would be the most interesting for people in this crowd, for supersymmetry uh, theorists and phenomenologists. And then, well, I took a dive into the literature and you know the different mechanisms that you guys have uh, been working on, and and I, I found quite a few things that maybe uh, you know are interaction points. Uh, but very soon I lost hope uh, and uh, kind of got lost. Uh, so I, I decided to go the other way. The obviously the lazy way. So I will kind of uh, present what I think are the, the things that may be of interest to you. And uh, you know, knowing a thing or two about physicists and in particular theorists and phenomenologists, uh, I'm pretty sure that you know, if something interesting shows up, you know, we just, uh, as soon as we put it out there, uh, you know, people in this, in this room will just uh, jump on it and go nuts. So, um, so we'll spend some time uh, describing what we have seen so far and uh, the instruments that we are uh, working with that are giving us these beautiful results. I will spend most of the time on uh, describing the tests of uh, GR, that, um, well, the fundamentals, uh, the, the testing fu fundamental physics with gravitational wave detections, mostly um, uh, the nature of gravity, but also uh, having to do with uh, fundamental interactions and fundamental fields. Um, and then, very brief look to a couple of peculiar, peculiar observations that may be of interest. I will not cover stochastic backgrounds because I noticed that there, were, there was a, already uh, one talk that uh, was um, uh, uh, related, and there is another talk, I, I believe, tomorrow afternoon on, on stochastic backgrounds. And maybe, if there is time, briefly to d describe the prospects with uh, future generation of detectors. Uh, so these are the beautiful instruments that we've been working with, uh, the two LIGO detectors in the US and the Virgo detector in, uh, in Kashina in Italy. And most recently we had added to our network of detectors the, the um, Japanese Kagra detector, which just, start, which just joined the network um, at the very late uh, uh, third observing run. So we have 
so far, and, and this is of course, these are the, all the different institutes that uh, uh, contribute to the LIGO scientific collaboration, which I'm also part of. Um, right, so um, uh, very brief history of what's happened since 2015. Uh, we have we've gone a long ways since then. Um, so the, like in particle physics where you have um, year one, year two, etc., we have our observing runs. So we started with 01, uh, starting in September 2015. And if you remember the story very quickly, we, this is what we saw, a very uh, whoopingly loud uh, gravitational wave from a black hole binary. Uh, that was the first. And since then, we are here. Um, you can see the, uh, the blue and the, uh, and, and the orange dots uh, are the black holes and neutron stars, respectively, that we have observed in triplets. So, you know. Uh, two, uh, two, two compact objects in the progenitor and, and one final uh, black hole. Um, and this is uh, quite a populated um, kind of plot. So the, the, the y-axis is uh, the mass of each, by, uh, of, of each object. And you can see here the evolution in the rate of detection. So from 01 to 02 and uh, 03 was last year, well actually 2019, 2020. Uh, huge gap between the uh, gap of memory as well. Um, and you can see the, 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 the very sudden change of rate of detections uh, due to the, the upgrades between 02 and 03. And now we are uh, com coming close to the beginning of 04, where our detectors sensitivity will be boosted again. And we have a, a, a broader reach, which kind of gives us access to um, a much larger volume of the universe. Um, so we expect to have a further, very, quite dramatic boost in the um, event rate of detections. And then Kagra will also contribute to this network with relatively low uh, sensitivity in the beginning, and, but then um, we'll catch up. So this is the, the currently updated, so you can see the, it was very recently updated. There was a kind of delay by three months in the beginning of 04. Um, and uh, this is where we stand. So a couple of words on what we do uh, in gravitational wave data analysis uh, to test uh, the physics and look for new physics. Uh, so obviously we have um, two stages in our in our analysis. So we have, we have to deal with a direct problem, which is already quite hard. So given a, a gravitational wave source of known properties, what is the immediate gravitational wave signal? And then for, for this, you know, um, for decades, uh, this problem has been attacked both from the analytical perspective and, from, and with numerics. And you can, um, I mean, it's a PDF, so you cannot see the, the video, but this is uh, one of the uh, numerical simulations at very high um, resolution showing a binary black hole merger. Um, uh, but we also have to, do, to deal with the inverse problem because our data is very noisy. Um, and uh, so namely, given a stretch of noisy data, what are the, can you infer the properties of the source that emitted the signal? And for binaries, in particular for black hole binaries, this is the parameter space that we have to explore, massive spins, uh, sky location orientation of the source, etc. And and you know, uh, using Monte Carlo or uh, Bayesian uh, inference methods, we end up with um, posterior distributions on the source parameters. And we use them, we expand, extend the parameter space to account for possibly new physics and put, put bounds on those. So the, the, the typical thing. Um, so when, when testing uh, fundamental physics, like you know, the, the nature of gravity uh, and gravitational waves, with with our uh, with our data, what we are testing is actually uh, um, a combination of many different things. So we test the generation of gravitational waves, the propagation, and by detection here, I mean the projection of the signal onto the output of the detector. So mainly, for instance, uh, you know, the, the, the gravitational wave polarizations will give you uh, the um, the final output uh, on the on the detector of the detector, on the detector data, data stream. Um, together with this, implicitly, we also test uh, our waveform systematics. So, um, you know, um, an analysis can be at most uh, good, as good as the, the, our model. Um, and also the, 
that, that model includes the, the model for our detector noise and calibration. So these are like implicit kind of information that we um, we silently test, in, including our tests. Uh, but we are trying to distinguish between the real physics, of course, and the, uh, the things that we don't care so much about. And I think we're uh, doing a thorough job at this. Um, related to our model, uh, you know, the, for, for compact binaries, for coalescing compact binaries, this is a, a problem of uh, a two-body two body problem in GR, which is we have to do, um, attack in a, in a perturbative way. And this is a simple uh, expression for the, the signal, so the strain, you know, including the plus and cross, cross polarizations that we expect to see. Uh, and you can see uh, an amplitude and the phase. The phase evolution is uh, determined by the GR dynamics for, for binaries. And you can see that the coefficients of the, this post-Newtonian expansion, uh, where the, the uh, small parameter is uh, the orbital velocity over the speed of light, um, these, these coefficients are determined by GR. Uh, and the, the, the functional dependence on the intrinsic parameters, so the masses and the spins of the, of the, of the two bodies, are determined uh, by GR. So um, this is for the in-spiral, and of course this is not the end of the story. The numerical relativity have to complete the picture uh, during the, uh, the very um, nonlinear merger phase. Um, and then we, the black hole perturbation theory, together with um, numerical information from numerics, will give us the, uh, the ring down the final stage where the, the final black hole is uh, ringing away its um, um, uh, asymmetries and ending up in a quiescent care state. Um, so in our analysis, we have uh, a number of models that are in spiral measure ring down models that describe the, the entire um, duration. And I will briefly um, show the, the, the most, um, well, uh, the mo yeah, the, the um, main results of our analysis relating to the um, testing the nature of the of the compact objects that we observe the uh, the nature of gravitational waves propagation the, and the generation process um, so um, one of one of the tests that you can perform that doesn't need to know anything about the uh, um, well the the underlying uh, possible modifi modifications in the underlying theory is whether your signal is consistent with itself. So the in-spiral part of the signal is consistent with the post-in-spiral part of the signal, namely uh, that they predict the same final mass and final spin of the final black hole. And this is like a, a, a demonstration of the events in the b before O3 and the events in O3. And you can see that you know, uh, GR lies at the zero zero uh, point on that plane and the events are nicely uh, the, the posteriors are nicely distributed around this uh, GR value predicted value uh, these are deviations possible deviations from the uh, mass the final mass and final spin that is predicted by the GR model and we see a pretty consistent picture there are a couple of posteriors that you can see that are off the center and these are uh, mainly attributed to um, weak uh, quality in the post in spiral, I believe. But in any case, you know, if you, when you have a few tens of uh, events to analyze, these are 90% contours. So, you know, uh, statistics, statistics will tell you that eventually you will get something that is off. And as long as it's not terribly off and that, uh, you know, and the, the base factor is consistent with, you know, the distribution that you expect, you don't have to worry about. So, I mean, in the next few slides, I will show results uh, that are quite. Um, Disappointing from people who are looking for new physics, uh, but in any case, this is what we have. <laughs> um, the the other um, type of test that is my one of my personal favorites is the is probing the uh, post-Newtonian spiral dynamics, so the the, the binary dynamics, uh, and uh, allowing for a modification in the in any of these post-Newtonian phase coefficients in the in the expansion of the phase. Um, to vary, and this is, uh, these are kind of very typical effects that are predicted by uh, pretty much any modified theory that you can come up with. So modified uh, gravity will, or even a modification in the nature of the, um, of the compact objects, um, or the environment in which they merge. So 
also interesting from a particle physics perspective, uh, would um, modify the dynamics, the binary dynamics, and this would uh, be manifested as a modification in the Poussinonian expansion, in the coefficients of the Poussinonian expansion, at different orders. So here you have, I mean, uh, Newtonian order is here, and you have um, uh, 0.5, like a, a half pn uh, term here, 1 pm being at phi 2, etc. And, and you can see that we have put bounds on the on the on possible deviations from uh, the GR predicted values. So these are all upper bounds. Um, and of course, um, the the lower you get in the higher you get in Poisson-Tonian order, the the the, the, late, the uh, further you probe um, the late stage of the stages of the in spiral. So the last few cycles will give you most information about the high order Poisson-Tonian terms, the low uh, frequency you know, in, the, in the early in spiral will give you information about the low Poisson-Tonian terms. So it's no wonder that the single uh, Newton star binary event that we're using in, the, in our analysis is dominating the, the uh, minus one Poisson-Tonian um, test. And these are the, posterior, the combined posteriors that we have uh, on these uh, Poisson-Tonian coefficients. Uh, further, on the nature of the black holes or the compact objects that we believe are black holes in the binary, uh, it is well known that the, once you know the, spin and the, the, the mass and the spin of a black hole, you, can know, you know everything about it, all the properties, in, in particular the, uh, the quadrupoles, the, the multipolar expansion of, of the black of, of space-time, so the, the spin-induced mass quadrupole um, for care black holes has a coefficient of one, but this is not the case for exotic compact objects, um, either with uh, some matter content or uh, in modified gravity or, um, or other like vacuum configurations, uh, more exotic configurations. This is a contribution that comes at the second position in order in the expansion, and you can probe and you can see that uh, these are also um, well constrained to be, well, basically the posteriors, uh, the bulk of the posterior is consistent with, uh, the, the, uh, the, with zero, which is the GR predicted value for the deviation. What are the typical deviations? So it, 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 depends, it depends what kind of object you are looking at. So, you, you know, if, if you have a neutron star or a boson star, this can be quite large, um, tens, uh, yeah, in, in the tens, I guess. So once you, you know, if, if, you, comp if you stack information together and you um, ask, you know, whether all these objects are black holes or boson stars, then you can come up with a constraint like this. Um, for other cases like gravel stars or uh, more exotic vacuum things, I think, I think the, the deviation is smaller. But um, yeah, this is very model dependent, of course. <clears throat> yeah, for boson stars, it can be in the hundreds, I think, uh, not only, yeah, uh, much larger than neutron stars even. Uh, probing the ring down, so like I said, the, the final state is assumed to be a curved black hole, um, and and we, you know, the um, the the way it is uh, settling down to a to a curved configuration is by ringing away um, the non-axis symmetries uh, of the final, like peanut-shaped unified horizon, um, and in 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 the in the form of gravitational waves. Uh, that are of specify a specific frequency and dynamic time. So these are the the, quasi the non quasi normal modes of the final black hole. I mean, this is uh, it takes uh, a bit of time until it gets to the uh, well th that that this uh, uh, quasi normal mode spectrum approximation is a good approximation uh, because you know you you have a stage between the time of the merger and about 16 m after that where you have high, high, highly nonlinear effects. So you need to start your analysis uh, far, far enough from the merger time that you can expect your, your model of uh, a superposi superposition of damped sinusoids to be um, uh, consistent, to, to be uh, accurate. So 
Um, one thing I wanted to point out here is that so far we haven't been able to probe much more than the, the dominant mode, the L, L, L plus 2, M equals 2 mode, um, the fundamental one, so no, uh, uh, no overtones. There, there, is, there are weak signs of the presence of overtones and perhaps a secondary mode in one or two um, uh, binaries, in one or two, or two events, but nothing conclusive. Um, so with, not, not with much confidence. So the, the, the prospect for the evolution of this kind of test is, uh, um, is quite interesting because, you know, um, in the next, we ho hopefully in the next few years, we will be able to probe um, multiple modes for each event, for the loudest events, uh, which means that we will be able to perform a consistency test between um, uh, the, the um, frequencies and damping times of uh, each of the modes observed. Since, you know, um, once you observe uh, a mode, you can pin down the, ma the final mass and final spin of the black hole, and then everything else that you observe after that is pretty much a consistency test. Um, with the theory and with the, with the actual nature of the compact object. Um, but <clears throat> further, you know, post ring down, is there anything else or could there be anything else beyond there? And theory tells us that it's possible to have an exotic compact object that instead of a horizon has some structure where uh, modes are trapped in a double well, for instance, in the case of a wormhole, for example, or a, a gravel star or some other exotic object. And um, so, so modes are leaking away uh, in the form of echoes that, you know, uh, as they bounce up and down in this uh, uh, potential well, and they leak out uh, towards infinity, towards the observer. And we have um, uh, been testing for these echoes, post ring down echoes, uh, with both uh, modeled analysis and uh, an unmodeled analysis that is looking for any kind of echoey type of signal after the, the ring down. And uh, I, this is kind of the, the best summary plot that I could find, which is mainly, thank you, um, giving a, a distribution of p-values. So uh, having, you know, having been looking at plots of particle physics, you're probably very familiar with p-values. And this is pretty much consistent with um, no uh, presence of, of echoes in the events uh, in, in so far. Um, another very interesting and very generic effect that you may have in either modified gravity or uh, some, some um, uh, well, essentially uh, a theory that predicts um, a modified dispersion relation for in the gravitational sector uh, is, uh, well, dispersion uh, where you have gravitational waves at different frequencies traveling at different speeds, lower than the speed of light, uh, slower than the speed of light. And this will induce, uh, in, in the case of a massive graviton, this is what, what the, um, the effect would look like in the phase, so an additional term at uh, one Poisson-Tonian order. Uh, a, a generalization of this is a case where you have modified the dispersion relation for the graviton, uh, whatever that is, uh, with um, an additional term that, is, that has a, a certain um, uh, uh, well, um, a monomial, monomial in the momentum. So in the case of the massive graviton, this would be uh, alpha equals zero. But then you have uh, um, Lorentz and various violating theories where you can have any kind of exponent in here or even more complicated things like contractions of this uh, with uh, some tensor. So uh, the, most of this, except for a special case of alpha equals two, will break Lorentz and various in one way or another. Um, and then you can probe the, um, the length scale of this um, effect. And, and the, the basically you can co put constraints on the, on the amplitude because so far we have not observed uh, dispersion in our, in our data. Uh, there are particular theories that predict uh, such an effect, uh, but I'm not going to um, focus on those. I'm just going to give uh, mainly the, the current bound on the mass of the graviton. Um, based on the fact that we don't observe dispersion in our, in our uh, data, which is at, uh, currently at 1.27 times 10 to the minus 23 electron volts, which is quite a, quite a small number, I believe. Um, 
And this is, this is a plot describing the, uh, the constraints from um, the latest data set in comparison with the previous data set in the gray triangles here for different values of alpha of these exponents, both in the subluminal and superluminal super sector. And finally, um, we can probe the, after the propagation effect, we can probe also the, uh, the polarization content of gravitational waves that we have observed so far. So the, the gravitational wave signal is projected on our detectors uh, with what we call the detector or tensor. And this, is, this has a different kind of uh, projection um, expression for the different polarizations. Uh, in GR, we have two polarizations, the plus and the cross for gravitational waves. In modified theories, this is again an animation that will not show in the PDF. In modified theories, um, we can have four more polarizations. Um, we can have longitudinal modes and the breathing mode. Um, and uh, so far, we have seen no evidence that any of the alternative hypotheses, alternative models that include the possible presence or, or either um, a scalar mode or a vector mode. Um, so the, these are all, um, well, so let me explain what we see here in the different columns. We have the, the, the competing hypothesis and the base factor of those uh, against the, the simple you know, tensor model for GR. So by S, we mean a pure scalar, and by T, we mean a pure tensor uh, model, and V is a purely vector model. And here we have also mixtures between tensor and scalar and tensor and vector. Uh, for this, the, the base factor is uh, consistent with zero. For uh, the pure models, we have uh, more compelling evidence against. Um, yes. Oh, um, right. So uh, I'm going to very briefly run through um, special, some special results from special events, uh, like the. Um, uh, the first neutro binary neutron star detection that gave us um, also elect an electromagnetic counterpart and allowed us to uh, constrain the difference between the speed of gravity and the speed of light to uh, about 10 to the minus 15, one, one part in uh, 10 to the 15, uh, and also the um, difference in the effect of the Shapiro time delay between the two signals. So these are, these are very kind of generic uh, constraints that are, you know, apply to any theory that predicts a modification the, in the propagation speed for gravity. Um, also con constraints on extra dimensions, since you know, uh, gravitational waves may leak into these extra dimensions. Uh, you can um, actually let me skip that, this. But one, if I may, one result that I, I would like to, um, and it's pretty recent, I would, I would like to point out, has to do with uh, additional fund fundamental fields, um, uh, in, in particular for a, a, a very light uh, boson. Um, whenever you have a, a, a very light boson wh whose um, Compton wavelength is uh, pretty much comparable with the Schwarzschild radius of the black hole, uh, you will get uh, stimulated growth uh, by the, the, the spin of the black hole. So you will have what we call super radiance and we'll have a growth of a, a bosonic cloud around the black hole which will eventually decay slowly and will uh, give two, uh, two distinct um, signatures. One is a, the direct gravitational wave signal during the decay with a continuous wave emission. And the other one is an effect on the population statistics. So the population uh, of uh, black holes in the, um, the, the mass and spin, on the mass and spin plane. So we will have, um, during the growth phase of, the, of this bosonic cloud, you will have a spin down, a rapid, a rapid spin down with a short time scale for the black hole, um, and, event uh, uh, and yeah, eventually you will have um, part of the parameter space of black holes being cut off uh, from observations. So you will not observe highly spinning black holes for a given, you know, uh, a given mass. Um, and this is something that people are uh, very interested in looking into uh, now that we have a, a decent amount of black hole observations and statistics. Uh, on the direct detection of gravitational wave side, um, you can put set bounds by non-detection of a continuous, continuous gravitational wave emission, uh, observation. 
Um, so the, the, the non-detection of a continuous signal has allowed us to put bounds on the, uh, on the presence of uh, 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 an ultralight boson. And this is, the, this is one of the plots in this paper, which I invite you to have a look at. This also um, includes um, a picture where you have an axionic uh, boson, uh, an axion-like boson with masses of the order of 10 to the minus 13, 10 to the minus 12 eV. Um, and you can have different constraints uh, assuming you know, the presence of such objects at different distances. Um, yeah, I, I will skip these um, special events, which are kind of a question marks um, and not fully understood with the current astrophysics. Uh, and I will just leave you with a summary of the different type of kind of uh, effects that we may have uh, with new physics in gravitational waves. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ernesto. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> two minor points. For, for the ultralight scalars, anything lighter than the 10 to the minus 13 electron volts, you have no constraints? Yeah, so the, the main constraint 13. is that the uh, Compton wavelength, so it's the, the, the mass of the, of the particle will mm -hmm. you know, give you a Compton wavelength that has to be comparable with the, uh, the size of the black hole, the, scale of the, the length scale of the black hole, because otherwise you will not have um, the formation okay. of a, a cloud in you know, uh, in uh, the required time scales. Okay, thank you. And you didn't mention primordial black holes. Sorry? You didn't mention primordial black holes? I didn't mention, I, I, I saw there was a talk about primordial black holes, so I thought that would be covered uh, by someone else. Okay. So yes, I should have mentioned it in the, my list of things that I didn't mention. Thank you. <clears throat> what was the next slide? There is one that we that. So this is, uh, this is one of the very interesting events that we saw uh, in 03. Um, this, has, uh, uh, this, is, this is a heavy, the, the, mass, the most massive binary that we have seen so far. And most interestingly, the primary mass falls right into the mass gap predicted by astrophysics. So, so you have the, the, the mass gap uh, due to the apparent stability that, uh, well, I mean, the, the lower bound of this gap is has quite an uncertainty because you know it's, it's model dependent, but it should range between uh, about 60 and 80, I believe. Um, sorry, 60 and 70 solar masses, I believe. Um, so the, this um, this black hole shouldn't be there. Uh, and why wouldn't those black holes be themselves emergence? That is one explanation. That is a, a second, like a, a second generation yeah, of black yeah. hole. There are other things that are interesting about this signal. Uh, so I, I wouldn't put too much attention to, um, well, you can see that it's a very high, because of the very high mass, it's, the data is mainly coming from the very final cycle, if it is a black hole binary, under this assumption, and the ring down. And it basically looks like a blip. It's, uh, it's very easy, it's, you know, the, the, the underlying model uh, is, would be quite uninformative um, just because, you know, part of the, a lot of the, you don't have any spiral signal to pin down the, the progenitor mainly. So, you know, people have tried different things and have been able to match other models better than uh, uh, the um, quasi-circular black hole binary model. For instance, you know, they, they have looked into uh, dy dynamical capturing um, of uh, highly eccentric black hole binary. Other people have looked into like head-on collisions of Proca stars and they managed to get a higher base factor. Of course, then you have to consider the, your prior, so you know, the, the base rate uh, for, you know, the possibility of having two Proca stars colliding head-on. You know, what is that? Um, what, what would be the event rate of such cases? And so, you know, um, but this is very interesting because it allows for interpretations further than a typical black hole binary that you have in, in your cohort.
Okay, well, so welcome back. So we'll continue now with the, the next uh, part of the program, and it's uh, great to have the Dimitri Nanopoulos to be the next speaker. Dimitri, please. Good morning. Thank you for the invitation here. Now, what I'm going to discuss here is some uh, efforts that we have made with uh, different groups, and you see the names in a short while, about uh, unification and getting uh, things from the string directly. Now, that's the title of my, of my talk. Is cosmology and phenomenology from, from the superstring no scale flipped as U5. Now, here, yeah, good. Uh, this actually, I could spend with this thing the whole talk, but I'm not going to do this. What you could see here, it is this is from a paper with uh, John Ellis, Keith Holly. Marcos Garcia and Atsumi Nidata, that somehow we have, we got some inspiration from the super string, and we're using no scale supergravity and click as you five, and putting these two together, we can get now some coupling through here to go to the I think you need to the microphone. I need the microphone. <laughs> it, it helps. Now, so we have, so we, the one helps the other, and for instance, as we're going to see in a moment, we can get easily Starobinsky-like inflation from here with all the fallings of what we know, and then we can go move on and we get some strong reheating, and we get all the properties that we need to have, gravitational production and uh, dark matter, and from here, lipogenesis, and so on. Now, all of these things that you see here, we have done it in an effective theory, right, from, from this thing. We can make the correlations and everything and stuff like that. The idea here, it is, if it is possible to somehow to get this thing inspired, because we keep doing inspired, 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 as, as you know also, and you have talks here, uh, we have to be very careful if we start with a bottom-up approach, with a, vis -a -vis the, if there are problems of ultraviolet kind of completion and stuff like that and so on. So we'll try to make some efforts here with uh, Ignatius Doniadis and Yanis Rizos, who is actually from this university here, and getting this stuff from uh, the super string derived Suzy Flitters U5. Now, let me say right away that in this case, we can calculate, we have full calculability, both from the no scale part, for an effective part that we're going to get, and also for the gauge part. So both of these things can be, we have full calculability, and then you see here's some papers, that, some old papers anyway that we put in use that you can see how we can calculate this. I'm not going to go through the calculation, obviously, I'm just going to use uh, the results that we have done. Now, um, let me just remind you in half a second that in the case that we have the flipped as U5, the different fields, maybe you have heard about this, is the 5, the 10, and then what is happening is because we have this, uh, the, this, the flip between the up quark and the down quark, the right-handed quarks here, you have to put the charged leptons outside, and then because of this, then we have to have here a right-handed neutrino, which is good, of course, because of the, of the story of, of we know that the right-handed neutrinos are there because we have mass for the neutrinos. The corresponding Higgs now, as we maybe have heard, that I don't need to use a joint, and that's a good thing from the string. It's, I think it's the only model that I know that we don't need to use a joint, and we can do it with a with a 10 and a 10 bar, and then you can calculate the potential here, the different terms. I would like the different masses here, down, up, charged leptons. Here we have this weak, the double, triplet splitting here, and this is a very fundamental one. Please remember that one here, which is a 10 and an H bar, the Higgs here, and a singlet that we need to have in this model automatically. And then we use this kind of uh, 
Alice Kunas Zetra uh, potential, who has been derived uh, after with by Ed Witten from, from the string, and then we put, we're using this thing as an effective theory to do our, our business here. Now, one point here that John did in the morning, it is that here, of course, we have an extra Geizino here because of this U1 here, which is, does not need to satisfy the universality conditions if you want to use universality, and also because we have this right-handed uh, singlets out, and for instance, in the case of G minus 2, it is mu, and that's why, uh, if you remember in the morning, that uh, by, we can use different values from this thing here and from this thing here, and then we can even ex maybe explain a part of, of the G minus 2. Now, uh, let me now uh, present this story, how we can get this kind of thing. The Gates group, I'm using the fermionic uh, formulation that has been developed by Adoniadis, Bahas, and Kunas, for this thing here, using on the terotic uh, string. And then the group that we're getting, it is, uh, of course, you have to have the boundary conditions, and because of the boundary conditions, then you can get now, you can choose the boundary conditions, and then actually the model that we using here is a model that we did back in 89, and this is the, what we call the revamped model with uh, John uh, Ignatius Adoniadis and John Hagelin. And this is actually, this is the gauge group here, the observed part, SU5 cross U1, and then we have this uh, extra U1s here, and then you have now the hidden group in SO10 times SO6. Well, we have now actually, in this case, SO6 is good because uh, it says U4, and then we're going to have some uh, four plates that they're going to have some funny charges, but then we're going to have confinement for this thing, exactly like what's happening in, in, in QCD. Now, here it is the, um, the super potential we can write down at the tree level. I'm not going to, I'm going just to present some terms that we want here. That's one term here. That's another term here. Another, it's another term here. Now, these three terms that you see here, this is basically that will correspond this directly your cover coupling at the tree level, and this is going to be the bottom quark, this is going to be the top quark, and this is going to be the uh, tau lepton mass, right, for this thing. And for instance, you see from the very beginning that this the coefficient here is the same for the bottom and the top, and so these kind of things that we're getting back in the 70s, it's, it's back here. And then there is another term which is very fundamentally what I'm going to say in a few minutes. It is a term that it is an F4. This is a, uh, a decaplate and five, F5 bar. This is going to correspond to the H bar, and this is the singlet here. So that's a very fundamental term that's going to play a very important role to our, to our discussion here. Now, so now let me just remind you in a second that it is uh, with, uh, together with John and with Keith, Almost 10 years ago, a month after almost the Planck 13 data came out, then we, know, we knew about the R square, et cetera, et cetera, and we tried to find out something that can come out from supersymmetry, supergravity, or, or the string and stuff like that. And then we noticed uh, very easily, we noticed very easily that if we take this, the no-scale supergravity model that I presented before, and we plug in the simplest possible uh, uh, superpotential here, actually it's a Vesumino superpotential, we can put it here, then in this case, you're automatically getting a Starobinsky type model, of course with corrections, because this is a real theory. And uh, we can, one thing that I'm, I'm trying to do here is I'd like to stress the following thing, that you see here, this is the corresponding uh, uh, Starobinsky term, and then you have these extra terms that we have, and you notice always here that we have, that we have a positive term for the Higgs boson, for the term that, that breaks SU5 cross U1, and then you can see from here, and you can check it, that we don't have during inflation and during even after when we have reheating, SU5 cross U1 is not broken, is in the symmetric phase. This is a very interesting result because we're going to use in a moment to, to make some physics out of it. So this is what we're discussing about this kind of thing. So we discussed with Ignatius and Yanis about this superpotential, and Ignatius was adamant that we cannot do 
a string model with such a kind of, of super potential, and also because we also would like to explain, of course, that this mass here, you know, is 10 to minus 13, and these coefficients have to be very exactly what it is, and so on and so on. So basically, we have now another hierarchy problem, if you notice, right, for this thing. We have about this intermediate mass for, for the inflation scale, right, for this thing. So what we did, it is uh, we have written something with John and Keith when we make a classification of what kind of, of superpotential we can have, and we got one there that it looked very uh, interesting, and we can go after it to, to get from the string. And, no, and lo and behold, you know, what is going on here, it is, uh, first thing is, let me tell you, this is the Keller potential that we get for, from the string. So this is, we calculated this. So this is not, you see, it does not look exactly what we had used before, right, for this thing. We just calculated this. So you can calculate it explicitly, this uh, kind of thing here. And then we have these two fields, the Z and, and Y field here. And then also we calculated, this, as we're going to see in a moment, this, the super potential that it, we have these corresponding couplings here. And actually, let me tell you right now, if you go and plug in and do your, you know, this is a first year graduate calculation, then you get here, of course, Starobinsky again in a different, I mean, the same uh, kind of model with the different corrections that can be different from what we had it before. Now, the thing is, what it is these two fields? Actually, what we have in here, you remember that we have this term that couples the singlets with the heavy Higgs and with the, with the decuplet, and this is very important term because this is the singlets that they give masses to neutrinos that you observe at, at, at low energies. Because we have a double uh, CSO mechanism, right, for this thing. We have the first part down here, and then we have the second one here, the standard story that we use this, these days. And, and, and these terms, exactly, it is one of these terms that's going to be the e flaton in our case. And actually, we found at the tree level, there is a term like that. They can, and then you can basically you can have from here a massive part, and then we have now a massless part here, which is going to be the the the, the inflaton right fr from this kind of thing here. And then you go and calculate to see how what we can get from this thing. And then after a lot of calculations and a lot of calculations, Yanis is not here to tell you how much it takes. It is, but we are confined anyway because of COVID. So you know, we tried and stuff like that, then what is going on here, so we get now the potential, that the super potential that we get, who looks very much like this one here, and then we have now all of these things are corresponding constants that you can calculate in, 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 in the string theory and, and this coefficient, stuff like that. And where is Miriam here? Here it is. And actually, you know, some of these things looks, say, well, it's orders of magnitude and stuff like that and so on, but she wrote with her students and her postdocs a paper how to go and calculate this in front, of, not the non-normalized terms, but even these coefficients there from this thing here, and then you have to be very careful with this, with this uh, thing here. So this is the two terms that we have here, and then... Yanis Papadimitri. Okay, fine. Sorry, I forgot. The, always I'm for a Greek name, anyway, so... Uh, uh, so here we have now, you see, you notice now this term here, and then you see what we have here, we have phi three bar, phi three bar and phi three bar square. So you see this thing here, and you see with the constant here, it's exactly the terms that we were go wanting to have in order to get this kind of super, uh, super potential, in order to get this Starobinsky thing. I repeat, there was a lot, thousands and thousands of, of, of terms from this thing, and it is we found a single term at this sixth order, and then we get another single term in, in the eighth order, right, from, from this uh, kind of thing here. Now, and then you see now to do some, uh, to put some numbers in, then we parameterize this thing the following way, and then basically what we do is we, you, in, in this type of models, it is generic that we have now what we call an anomalous, these four U1s, if you go and see for them, one of them, it is anomalous. Of course, it's not anomalous, we're doing string theory, right, for this thing, and then we use the dyne seinberg witten mechanism, right, from this thing here, that you shift the dilaton and you get this excited factor that goes all over the place, and then, 
this place here, this xi square, it's about this number. I mean, it is this number, and then xi is about one-tenth of the string model, which means that I can use this number to, get, to do perturbation theory. And also, because of, of, of the, all the singlets that they have uh, anomalous or not anomalous U1s, right, for this thing, they are all related. So when you do go to go, do the flatness condition, then you get relations between them. And actually, that's what we spent all the time for this paper. And if, if you go, it's about 50 pages paper. If you go and look at it, most of the time, it is the flatness conditions that we're, t we're talking about and how to satisfy them and stuff like that. And so that's what the parameter that we're using here, which is calculated dynamically, right, fr from, from this uh, thing here. Now, and then you go and you put, here it's analogy I'm using about, right, fr from uh, this kind of thing. That was the term I wanted. Here are the corresponding terms here. And then if you go and use, and I'm go, we're, we were using generically xi, because of course one thing could be one third of xi, or that be one over root two of xi, or whatever it is from this thing. We're using generically the, this xi value for the vacuum extension values that were coming out from the flatness conditions. And then, then we, what we do here, it is we go and calculate now this scale and then you see what's happening if you plug in the numbers for what we were using, and we, I repeat, we spent some time to do it correctly, then you see now you're getting this number here, which is just 10 to the 13 GV. So it is a higher order term coming from n equals six and n equal eight, this kind of thing combination here, and that we go dynamically for this thing. Of course, because the Eflaton part, the in Latino, if you want, whatever it is, it's related, it's involved in the neutrino masses and stuff like that. So we should not be surprised now that we find a connection because always was very strange why inflation occurs at 10 to the 13 GV and stuff like, or right for this thing, which is very near to the case that we expect the right hundred neutrinos of the order of 10 to the 12 GV that we know for years, right, in order to do business for this thing. Now we know. Now the answer is very simple. Now it, because it is the same particle, that somehow the, super, the same supermotive that evolves in one case and evolves in the other case, and of course supersymmetry breaking is very small, so that's why the Eflatino and the Eflatino, if you want, have the same mass. So we get this explanation here. And now, and I repeat again, that this is a calculable, we calculated this number, we calculated this pot superpotential, we calculated this number and turned out to be um, on the right uh, kind of thing here. And here I have some comments. I don't have the time to go through this kind of thing here, that we have what we get some different kind of, because you started with xi, but then of course it's not every field that is going to get xi thing, because then you have to satisfy the flattness conditions. And then in order to satisfy the flattness conditions, you, you get a lot of equations, and then you get num uh, types of this form here and so on, just to show how business is happening. Now, let me now go to, uh, to the neutrino uh, thing here that I was talking about for this thing, because now you see what's happening here. It is, this is if the super pattern of the Eflaton here. It is decaying. You see it's couples for here. It's mixing with the, with the uh, right-handed neutrinos here. And then what you get, it is you can get now, because that's going to give us the reheating, right, for this thing. But you have to be very careful how you do reheating right for this thing, because you can uh, hurt yourself with, with uh, if you have a lot of big number here, because then you're getting too many gravitinos, and that means you're getting too many neutralinos and stuff like that, and then you don't know what to do. And inflation has finished, right, from this thing here. Though here, there is another thing that's very important in, in, in this case that we're discussing. It is, I told you that super, uh, SU5 cross U1 is unbroken after I finish everything with inflation. And now what it is happening, it is, it remains unbroken until what is going on here. We have now an SU5 cross U1 vacuum and SU5 and this broken vacuum, right, for this thing. But while this does was a broken, then what you have is we have now a lot of degrees, light degrees of freedom, and because of the minus pi square over 90 t to the fourth term here, now what's happening is this is actually where the universe is staying in this, in the, in this phase, in SU5 cross U1 phase. And it takes some time. 
before we reach a point that we have now this, we have now the, the difference to come up, and then what's happening is as you five cross you one, it becomes confined. This is exactly a scenario that I have with, with Keith and uh, Kiriakos Tambakis back in 98, 81 or something like that, that early from this thing here. And then we have now this flop, and then we have now that we're moving to the case of the, of the real vacuum. Because of this, and because of that, this is late, this phase transition, we have entropy generation. And because we have entropy generation, that we have to be careful to take into account in all these uh, kind of numbers. And actually, it helps us, and you go and calculate this. Uh, okay, this is the neutrino story here. And now you see now, basically, we're getting entropy generation of about 10, a factor about 10 to the fourth or something like that. And then what is going on, it is, of course, now what's happening is because we have a late phase transition, the right-handed neutrinos, they're massless because the, the SU5 cross Yan was unbroken, right, for this thing. Suddenly, it is broken around 10 to the 10 GV or something like that. It's unbelievable that the numbers turn out to be on, on, on the same kind of thing. When you calculate the degrees of freedom from SU5 cross U1 with respect to the other, and you put the confinement to, to find the confinement scale, you get always around the scale of 10 to the 10, uh, 10 to the 9 GeV, right from this thing here. And what's going on now, then right-handed neutrinos suddenly they get masses, they find themselves out of equilibrium, violently out of equilibrium, and they decay. And that's what they create, create Baryogenesis to the leptogenesis, failure on, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not going to go through this thing here, but then you go and calculate, and then you find out, and this is our numbers we're using, this is 10 to minus 11. Of course, all of these things, all of these things that you say, it's happening after the superpotential, which is from the string, right from this thing. Now, now then, it is normal uh, calculations, right from this thing here. And now, we're getting this... Uh, for instance, you can go and make a, some kind of um, scanning with these parameters, right, from this thing to see what we're getting. And then we, what we found, it is we're getting some very interesting results and some interesting correlations in, in, in this uh, case. And for instance, here we have now uh, the, um, about the baryon asymmetry, right, from this thing, that also we can calculate the sign of the asymmetry. It's very interesting that we can go, you have to follow through the whole, and you can kind of sign to, to get the right sign. And then here you see the case of one and another, and also you see here that this entropy generation that we got of 10 to the fourth that we can calculate with normal numbers, right from this thing here, plays a very important role into making the density, the dark matter density to be on the right side, and also the baryon asymmetry to be on the right side. And then you see here, for instance, that you get now out of, I don't know, two million points and stuff like that, and you make this kind of normal ordering or inverse ordering, right, from, from this thing here, and you get now, this is what we observe experimentally, the, the standard number, and then you see now that we're getting to a point when we get enough points to justify that it is not a fine tuning or something like that. And then you can get the corresponding relation between dark matter and, and uh, the baryon symmetry. And also you see we're in the center of things here. And then the same thing between delta, this uh, entropy factor, and MLSP, right, for, for, for this thing here. And actually here we make a very specific prediction. The prediction that we make here, it is for the whole framework here to work then what is going on is we have to have supersymmetry to be above 10 TV. Now, take it as you want, right, from this kind of things, and you see from these things here, everything in order to fit, we have to have rather heavy supersymmetry. Now, so we make some fixings. Let me go on, and, and I would like to come now and finish with this uh, kind of thing here because I have, I left now something for that. Now here what you see, this is from uh, Adoniadis, Elis Hagel, etc. In, in 89, and this is from this paper, that basically we have the corresponding term for the top quark, and then if you go and plot, right, for this thing, this is, this is the top quark coupling at the gut scale, and it is at MW scale, and actually we have an infrared point here. And now what you can see here, 
it is basically whatever you do, you have a limit on this uh, kind of, because you have infrared point here, and then you see if you go and, and, and check these numbers and put the real numbers in, we're getting now there, first it is less than 190, right, for this GEV, and then we get something which is between 170 to 180 GEV, it has been predicted at that time. Now, what's happening is, then you say, and then this was in 89, and then when it happens in 1995 for this thing here, then you say, why you didn't mention this? The answer is simple. We forgot, right, from this uh, kind of thing, but it was, was there. Now, so that's one thing with, with, the, with this uh, mass here, and also the same story with, uh, with the B and the tau. Now, here, and I'm finishing for this thing, is now you can ca go and calculate, now I'm in the phenology part, and you go and calculate the fermion masses, not the supersymmetric masses. There are some experimentalists that were telling us, always they're telling us about you cal masses that we don't know. Can you calculate the mass that we know, right, for this thing? Now, you see how we calculate the fermion masses, right, the ones that you know from high school, right, from this thing. Okay. Now, so what's going on here, because they are not at the tree level, so what you do is you, you know the rules, we go and calculate higher orders, right, for this thing, systematically, one after the other, right, from this kind of thing here. And here, we have now a term like that from an up quark, right, for this thing, with one, with one vacuum expansion value here, and that would correspond to, to, the, to the charm particle. Then we have now quarks, down quarks, which is, that would correspond to the S particle here for this thing, and that would correspond to the muon, right, for, from this thing. Now, and that's, of course, that's how we identify the generations, right, from, from this thing. Now, what is going on here? Now, for instance, for, for, I will come to this point in a moment, because we know what is the vacuum extension values, and you can calculate, and then you can see, for instance, something that it looks uh, a bit, a bit funny, that you have now this coupling here, and the coupling with the muon, so somehow you, it looks like the ms equal to m mu. Now, for the older of us in, in this office, it is getting there. Uh, it is an old story about the, I know now that ms equal m mu is a wrong relation, right, for this thing. ms equal m mu over 3 up there, right, for this thing, and becomes ms equal m mu right down here, right, from, from this thing here. Now, and then I will come for, for this explanation in a moment. Give me one second. And now here it is about the, the, down, the up quark here. You can calculate, you plug in the numbers that we use universally, and then we get now this relation that it is psi phi m, m top, right, for this thing, which is a good relation. And then we go through and we do all this analysis here from this thing. And let me just give me one moment. And here it is how we can get now this relation m mu equal 3. You can get now, mix this F2 with F1, who is getting the, vac the big vacuum extension value. And then from here you get this term here that you can fix with the relation with ms. And we can get this kind of relation that we want. And now, actually, we're getting something which is very interesting. We're getting now the Kabiba have just put the numbers there, all the numbers for, you know, to see. And then we get now this mixing with the Kabibo angle here. And this is psi to one half. It's basically ten, one tenth of one half, which is basically on the nose with the Kabibo angle, right, from, from this uh, thing here. Now, so, so here it is our proposal here for the masses. M top, M B, M tau, M C, etc. And that's, I don't know, to my knowledge, and also we get the, the electron mass, which is right on, on the nose here through, through, through this uh, non-normalizable uh, non coupling. And actually, for you know, all this together, I have never seen it before. I don't know, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm missing something. Maybe I'm getting too old, right, from this kind of thing here. But now, you see now with one parameter, Xi to getting now all these relations here, it is the first time we were seeing, right, for, from this thing. Now, let me now fin oh. I'm going to, yeah, yeah, you have seen this again. Ah, no. Let me finish with this kind of thing here, back in, uh, whatever it is, in 1990 with Jorge Lopez and, and, and uh, John, we have 
wrote a paper on, on, on these issues here, and we have defined some confinements and stuff, like, and we were very excited. And at that time, we wrote this kind of thing here. We say, we leave it to the reader to decide how many more miracles she wants to see before abandoning her doubts about Flip Test 5 Thank you. Thank you very much, Dimitri, for the interesting talk. Thank you. And uh, questions, origin questions? Yes. Very nice work, and thank you for the nice talk. I have two quick questions. Yes. The first is about the neutrino, ordinary neutrino masses. Yes. What, what hierarchy do you get? Uh, we get, yeah. Look, this is a talk not for a half an hour, right? For this thing is everything here. But, uh, okay, so this is not my time. Uh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. If you want, we can discuss it in private. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, yes. <laughs> we get, and also through the scanning that we did and stuff like that, we get normal ordering. Normal ordering. Normal yeah. ordering. Most, we got something like... Uh, 9,800 cases of solutions with, with normal ordering, and we get something 700, well, Keith is the Keith knows, 700 support or something like that of uh, inverse order. Right, Thank you. And, and, and for us, it's very important because if you go this to the, to the proton decay, in the end, you can see that if it, is, if it was yeah, inverse ordering, then you get that the muon is going to be... Yeah, that was my second, uh, okay. <laughs> actually, question. Very good. And a very quick thing on the baryogenesis. Yes. Uh, do you get baryogenesis through leptogenesis, through yes, right hand yes, and yes, neutrinos? Yes, the standard, okay, uh, the standard... Uh, uh, thank you. I'm getting old. Anyway, the standard, sorry, yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Dimitri. Thank you. Please uh, think again. Thank you. Okay, so the next speaker is Apostolos Pilatsis. And the title will be, uh, I guess, there. Okay, thank you uh, for the invitation. My voice is a little bit uh, so, uh, short, but it's not uh, COVID despite uh, continuous uh, testing and persistent testing. This is not. So I may, I may, yeah, my talk might be short, maybe short because of my uh, voice and uh, whatever. Right, so voice problems. Right, so I will talk today. And also, I'm very happy to be here. I'm, uh, it's a very nice place, and I like to see this bridge, actually. It's, it's uh, quite good to see this bridge. Right, so uh, the talk that I'm going to say today, what I present today, is a kind of review. And I would like to go also beyond this uh, standard uh, framework that uh, Dimitri talked before. And I would like to talk about uh, leptogenesis ideas which developed uh, in the recent years, and they allow for a testable or observable such lepton flare violation for, for, for the experiments, okay? So, uh, 
this uh, presentation here includes a recent work I did with uh, 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 one PhD student, Pablo Cadia da Silva from Chile, uh, one research fellow, which came from Ioannin actually, and uh, another PhD student uh, from UK, Thomas Maxwell. So, uh, so let me uh, give an outline of my talk. So the first thing I will uh, remind you, I think uh, Marcella did a good job here, uh, very briefly about the mother and the mother asymmetry and the connection of that to leptogenesis. Then I will uh, discuss something that was involved uh, in the last uh, uh, more than 20 years, uh, which is about resonant and uh, most recently tri-resonant leptogenesis. Um, then I will not have much time to discuss all the technical details, but I will flush the complexity of um, producing a consistent set of transport equations to uh, calculate that kind of framework, so which has to be flavor covariant, not just flavored. And uh, then I will uh, discuss what kind of charge lepton flavor or number violation you might see uh, at colliders and other experiments. And finally, I will give some numerical estimates of some benchmark uh, models and summarize my conclusions. So, uh, so far we know that the matter, I mean, unlike the cosmological constant, which some people have claimed that might be zero, so we know definitely that the baryon asymmetry in the universe is non-zero, and then actually two measurements which were compiled by Keith Olive and uh, collaborators, we know that the uh, baryon uh, symmetry from CMB and the baryon big magnocular synthesis blast deuterium give uh, two uh, very constrained mink uh, and are independent measurements and, and they are very close to each other. There is no discrepancy. And to explain that, uh, we all, all know or you, uh, that uh, you need, uh, in a CPT invariant theory, you need the so-called Sakharov's conditions for generating the baryon symmetry. The universe, assuming implicitly initially a bisymmetric universe. And I will uh, show how this uh, hidden condition is not needed in the framework I'm going to discuss. So you need a B violating interactions, C and CP violation to deal with chirality of fermions, uh, again in this uh, CPT invariant framework, and of course you need to some form of tau of equilibrium dynamics. I should say in the FRW universe, the last condition is already fulfilled in some form because you have a, an error of cosmic time, okay? And uh, the question is how much of that you need uh, to obtain, uh, to explain, to account for these results. Uh, so the popular scenarios of pyrogenesis, just reviewing a little bit of this, this stuff here, is pyrogenesis through the decay of heavy particle. Uh, so you may have a B-violating decay uh, this was back in 1978, and uh, uh, the, this was a good idea. Uh, you had to deal with problems like proton decay and also with problems with uh, what I'm going to discuss with phalerons, making sure that the B violation is not also uh, automatically, uh, has a component that violates B minus L as well, uh, so that the phaleron uh, interactions do not wash out. So, uh, this was a problem model building. Apparently, uh, it was solved in 212. Uh, I should say also from the beginning, uh, this point that uh, uh, the, this uh, field has developed uh, from my last work, what I did in 212 to 214. So you can see here that uh, another scenario uh, of baryogenesis uh, is at the electroweak phase transition. So. Uh, and uh, this proposal in 1985, you could have uh, uh, this perfect scenario through the nucleation of bubbles and through a first order phase transition, uh, did not work in the standard model. And uh, apparently, uh, yesterday, uh, I learned, or at least from the analysis that uh, uh, Marcella has presented, that uh, it's not also valid within the minimal supersymmetric standard model uh, because of the extended, uh, uh, because the parameter space is. is uh, uh, squeeze to zero, actually. Right, so you may combine now the two ideas. So uh, you need to have a very complicated model, uh, and you may ask whether it is a, a simple framework. You may combine the two ideas, and you may have a baryogenesis through leptogenesis. So you may have a decaying particle now, decaying not in a baryon-violating uh, way, but in a lepton number violating decay. 
This was discussed in 1986, so I think the, the first and the last graph was included in, at that time. And uh, uh, this is a good idea to uh, uh, use, of course, the sphalerons to convert the lepton asymmetry to the baryon asymmetry. I will not go more on that. So I will only discuss possible models of leptogenesis just for reviewing this stuff. Uh, the first uh, vanilla type leptogenesis, uh, as mentioned before, was proposed by Fukuhita and Yanakita in 1986. And uh, if you work it out uh, with naive hierarchical neutrinos, you find that the lower mass scale, mass bound of the lightest of the heavy neutrinos, has to be heavier than 10 to 9 GeV. This is what is called the Davidson uh, Ibarra bound. And uh, this was the case from 1986 up to 2004 or 2005. Okay, so, and uh, uh, of course, uh, this uh, idea has been, uh, uh, has the, the beautiful thing, of course, you have leptogenesis, but you nothing else. I mean, you may have light neutrino masses. Uh, you explain the lepton asymmetry, but there are no other uh, possibilities, at least to trace or trace uh, some aspects of uh, this leptogenesis mechanism. At least you bet in a very uh, higher uh, symmetric uh, framework, uh, like uh, the talk we, uh, we had before. So. Uh, another scenario is this what's called the resonant leptogenesis. In this case, uh, I will come back to that. Uh, you can evade that bound and other uh, possibilities. Uh, you may have uh, leptogenesis through Dirac in a kind of freeze-in uh, type of frame frameworks. But there are also other scenarios I'm going to talk here. Is the so-called non-thermal leptogenesis, which seem to work by, from Lazaridis and Saf in 1991. Uh, Affleck dyne or spontaneous leptogenesis, or CPT violating leptogenesis, which I'm not going to touch here. So uh, another point is that leptogenesis has a very, very complex flavor dynamics. You should not ignore that. Uh, this means uh, not only B minus L, but one third B minus the lepton number, the individual lepton numbers E, mu, and tau uh, are preserved by sphalerons. So you have to generate uh, the asymmetry using this conserve number and protect it. Okay, so, uh, so there are two sources of flavor effects in this case. So the ones that enter in your Boltzmann equations. Okay, so the first one is the ones that <laughs> do deal with such lepton yukawa couplings. And uh, these uh, were discussed, the reports of the discussed in 206 in more de in great detail. And they may modify the baryon asymmetry by one order of magnitude, and uh, around the scale, uh, this uh, Davidson Ibarra bound, 10 to 9 GV, where the mu and uh, tau Yukawa couplings uh, are going out of equilibrium, or in a quasi equilibrium. So, uh, the heavy neutrino, uh, however, there, are other, there is another source which is very important, uh, which gives a structure in this uh, flavor uh, space, which is originates from the heavy neutrino Yukawa couplings. And uh, this is uh, an idea in 2004. It took one year to convince the referee in physics review letters that these uh, effects may modify the predictions of the baryon asymmetry by uh, a huge factor 10 to the 6. Okay? And render, because of this, such lepton flavor violation in the resonant leptogenesis model, models observable. Okay, that's the, the idea. So that means this uh, uh, scenario evades that uh, problem we had before. Okay, so let me come to resonant, tri-resonant leptogenesis. This is a, a scenario, I, of course, you may have seen these uh, three graphs. And the important graphs that, are, uh, that enhance the lepton asymmetry are the self-energy graphs. These are already known uh, from 93 and 90, uh, 96. There were some papers on this. And, uh, of course, uh, this is reminiscent to a kind of K0, uh, K0 bar dynamics. And, uh, uh, however, you can see that uh, when you go closer, closer the mass degeneracy gets comparable to the width of the heavy neutrino. Then you have to do something else. You have to include the width, width effects here in this intermediate state. So the perturbative results become finite. And this was done in 1997. And, uh, of course, uh, you may say how you get inspired to that. I was inspired through my PhD times with a recent related paper, not on uh, leptogenesis, but it's collider physics from 1990. 
during my PhD time. Right, so there are variants of resonant leptogenesis. Uh, one is the so-called soft resonant leptogenesis, which uses uh, supersymmetry. Okay, it uses the soft supersymmetric uh, sources, which might be CP violating and may generate the, the non-degenerasis. The other is uh, you may uh, have this splitting of the heavy neutrinos through renormalization group equations. This is what's so-called radiative resonant leptogenesis. And, of course, you have uh, one year later, after 97-98, Akhmetov, Rubakov, and Smirnov came up with, uh, I think, uh, uh, very interesting uh, and related mechanism, which is uh, uh, resonant leptogenesis by uh, neutrino oscillations. Okay, so uh, the field theory of resonant leptogenesis, I don't have much time to discuss all the technical updates, but I'd like to give some glimpse on that. So this... Uh, uh, in order to obtain the uh, width effects, as already mentioned before, uh, you need to uh, get uh, at least uh, inspired uh, or at least extend the so-called lehmann szymanski zimmermann formalism for mixing a decay of heavy Majorana neutrinos. So you have this propagator, and this propagator of this particle alpha of one of the heavy neutrinos, you are... Uh, um, truncating, if you like, with the inverse resound propagator of the same particle, and then you multiply it with a spinner. And in this, way, in this way, you get an effective amplitude. So this is the, uh, for the two neutrino mixing, which he was discussed in 97. This was the propagator. So you have to take into account the chirality and all that stuff. Uh, and uh, for the three neutrino mixing, uh, of course, uh, you have a more complicated structure. I'm not going to show here, but they are in the papers with uh, uh, Thomas Underwood in 2004. Uh, we discuss a little bit of that, or we use them in, uh, with Frank Deppis. And recently, uh, we paid more greater detail in the dynamics that result from a tri-resonant uh, scenario. So here I should say that this uh, uh, mechanism, or this uh, way of getting effective coupling is used also in some collider uh, phenomenology to, decay, to discuss, for example, uh, the case of uh, uh, unstable particles, but I'm not going to go there. But most of the, these formalisms uh, for that is uh, presented uh, in 1997 and in, in 2004. So uh, also I do not. Uh, so you get an effective uh, amplitude. This H and this H, you can see, it has also absorptive parts for the self energy and also absorptive parts from the vertices. This B is the vertices, this A is the self energies, and you can see the mass difference here of the two heavy neutrinos get regularized from the absorptive part of the cell of energies, which is this A beta beta. And this is the complex conjugate uh, effective you have a coupling, and then the, it's very uh, simple now, you can uh, define lepton and gas symmetries, flavor the symmetries by getting the difference of these Yukawa couplings. Uh, I will, not, uh, I will uh, show how this works for two uh, uh, resonant uh, particles. So if the mass is, so this is a plot, as you can see, you have two masses, Mn2, Mn2 minus Mn1. So this is a parameter here that uh, parameterizes the deviation from the mass uh, degeneracy. And this is the CP asymmetry. Uh, the dotted line you see here, this is uh, that time was 10 TV, that's a plot from 97, uh, is the perturbative calculation. You can see it explodes when the mass degeneracy becomes very, very small. Uh, but the uh, resound propagator, the one that I discussed before, you have a, a, a maximum which could be close to one, and also it goes to zero as the mass differences become closer, as expected from a, a Yatskog type invariant from a CPT invariant, okay? Uh, um. So uh, you can have the, you can uh, use the, uh, also the scenario where the mass, the masses are in this region or in this region. So K0, K0 bar or B0 is in this region and the D0, D0 bar system, for example, is on the other side of this. So uh, experimentally, uh, we have three good paradigms that uh, go on both sides of this resonant region. So uh, now uh, the new idea now here is to not having two resonance, but you can have three in successive, uh, in, a, in a successive order. So N2 is divides, it deviates by one width, and the second one by the width of the other. And you have a democratic structure to uh, uh, see what happens here. And you can see that, which is 
some approximate this X symmetry. And the thing that what you see here is that the, uh, uh, the asymmetries you get are slightly enhanced, uh, enhanced quite significantly, I would say 40%, 30%, compared to the fact if you are using uh, the two, the bi-resonant, if you assume only two resonance that, uh, uh, if you take each pair of two resonance, or the three resonant formula, which we have uh, 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 presented in 204 with uh, Thomas Underwood. Right, so uh, this gives uh, further freedom to play with uh, the baryon asymmetry. Uh, to do that, however, in a more uh, sophisticated way, you need transport equations. These uh, were first uh, um, presented by Korp and Wolfram. Uh, I will not go through all these technical details. Uh, That's what we like to say, that this is exactly what we adopted uh, back in 2004. And then we calculate all these collision terms that needed for the Boltzmann equations. And uh, these collision terms require to take into account not only the decays of the heavy neutrinos, but scatterings, delta L equals. This one already known at that time. Um, and this one as well, the, with the Higgs. But we, we needed to extend that and take into account delta L equal not scatterings, flavor, cons uh, lepton number conserving, but flavor violating scatterings as well, because I said the flavor dynamics is very complicated. You have to take this all into account, as well as gauge mediated uh, interactions. We have here a gauge particle. Uh, okay, so uh, you may get some order of magnitude estimate. Uh, that's what we did with Frank Deppis. You can see here from the last formula here, uh, you can have delta, you take delta order one and then you need a k of the order uh, 1 million, so you can be almost, uh, k is a, a factor that parameterizes the, how far you are from out of equilibrium. So having k of 1 million, for example, um, you see that how close you are, you can be in equilibrium. Uh, this was vindicated now for uh, another scenario, 10 to 3. We like to see how there is an attractor solution. We studied that. This was missing in the previous. So we have a good confirmation there is an attractor solution where the attractor solution fails and so on. And the important point is here. I believe that's an important uh, feature. Uh, that uh, not five. I measure, okay, anyway, I mean, <laughs> seven minutes, okay. <laughs> Very exact. Uh, yeah, yeah, 25, but uh, I know when I started 40, okay, anyway, that's fine. That's fine, okay, seven. <laughs> right, so, okay, I missed the point now. So, by, uh, right, so, uh, uh, back uh, uh, in 2005, we, you can see we confirmed the fact that was also discussed that you can start with any baryon asymmetry, okay? Uh, you can have any uh, framework, uh, CPT value, you can, they, where the baryon asymmetry could have any value, positive or negative, and uh, microscopically, the model which I'm, is presented here, you will get the same value in the freeze-out region, okay? So, um, and I believe that's a very interesting, very uh, feature that the baryon asymmetry does not depend on the, uh, how the universe was uh, set before. It's just a prediction of your microscopic model. Okay? Right, so I will uh, go through that not so, I mean, you, you to do it in a more uh, quick way, I think uh, this was a, a paper we did in 2014. At that time, all of were very junior people, PhD students and deaf. I was the first research fellow in Manchester. Now all of them have, uh, of course, uh, branched in different fields. Quite. So the point here is that the uh, unified description, so with this formalism, which we like to advocate, there is a unified description of three physically distinct phenomena. The one is the resonant mixing between heavy neutrinos. The other is the coherent oscillation that you have to include. And there are different uh, regulators here. There's a factor of two. And, uh, of course, you have to include decoherence effect. This is all that done in 214. The only thing we need to do it in uh, this context. So let me go to a very important uh, effect, uh, which is to include uh, also relativistic degrees of freedom, varying relativistic of freedom, not only the T, the Q, but the H effective T. Uh, by doing that, you will see that the uh, baryon asymmetry uh, versus the heavy neutrino mass. So there are parameterization for that. So it's the dotted line is the constant, uh, which you usually people use. And uh, you see 
the, if you take uh, the running of the age effective of the entropy degrees of freedom, you may get different results. Actually, if you are very unlucky, you may get uh, zero uh, for heavy neutrinos below the 100 GeV. So that be, for heavy neutrinos that are below 100 GeV, there are huge uncertainties according to that calculation. That's the new result. So whatever you see, at least from our point of perspective, for uh, bounds and uh, limits, uh, combined limits and um, uh, plots uh, for uh, heavy neutrinos, for sterile neutrinos below, much below 100 GeV, uh, are, are suffering from these uh, uncertainties. And uh, in my view, uh, should be taken uh, with a great uh, pinch of, of salt. Uh, I will not have time to discuss all the lepton flavor by number violations, just to like to flash that you can have like sign dial lepton signals, you can get uh, constraints in this uh, parameter space, and this is what I was saying before, uh, you go very low in the heavy neutrino mass, then uh, you need to do uh, a different uh, job, including the varying degrees of freedom. So the same thing for B nu, that's a very nice plot. You can see all the experiments, how they are constraining the parameter space, heavy neutrino mass versus light to heavy neutrino mixing. Uh, I will not have time to go through resonance CP violation at colliders, not about muon colli uh, neutrino is double the decay, which has no constraint in our models. Uh, nu e gamma, uh, I should say here the neutrinos you have in this minimal model are exactly the heavy neutrino uh, the heavy neutrinos that produce mu to e gamma are the same heavy neutrinos you need for uh, uh, baryon asymmetry in the universe. Okay? That's a very important point here. So, uh, uh, for example, you can get some constraints here, 10 to minus 13 with 10 to minus 14. Uh, you get some constraints about this uh, transition from muon to neutrino and electron and uh, I will come back to that. So the same thing from mu3, I don't have time to discuss all that. We did the calculation, the complete calculation, uh, and also the coherent mu2e conversion, I think by Alonso and Tal, they also uh, used another method for nuclear physics, uh, but uh, all these form factors have calculated before by us. Uh, this is uh, an important project which is uh, running in the Fermilab, I should say. And uh, unfortunately, this paper is, uh, it seems to be no, uh, unaware about the cosmological relevance of their uh, experiment. So let me go to, that's my final part, the numerical uh, estimates uh, of these uh, scenarios. So in this scenario, you more probably know the Minkowski, the CISO mechanism. This is CISO mechanism by Minkowski 77 and other people. And this is the Minkowski term. Okay, so in addition to that, so you may have, uh, or you have, radiative contributions you have to include. And this is the type 2, so they have uh, an extra contribution uh, next to the three-level term, which is uh, one particle irreducible. It's a non-local contribution, obviously. And there are these two terms. Some of them uh, you can have models where you can put that to zero, and you have a like the a kind of uh, variant of inverse CISO model. Uh, this model this is not there, but you need to include these two graphs. Okay, and the other thing is you have this, all of them there, Th these heavy neutrinos can, can not be very, very heavy. Uh, sorry, not very, very different, okay? They have to be nearly degenerate. That's the, the lesson you, you learn from that, so you should uh, not forget the one-loop uh, contributions, and uh, this is what I keep saying that. Uh, of course, in some models, it's very small. So this is the plot we get. Uh, for the mu to e conversion, you may get something that could be prop at Fermilab, maybe. And, uh, okay, so uh, let me come to my conclusions. So uh, I hope I have uh, uh, somehow convinced you that it's interesting to look uh, that the resolute possession is an interesting uh, mechanism to explain matter and matter asymmetry independent of the initial B number state of the early universe. It doesn't matter what the, what the B state of the early universe is. So a complete, because we have to go out and do a complete treatment, this is quite complicated. So you have a, we have discussed here, tri-resonant and multi-resonant models offer new possibilities for model building, okay, which I have not discussed before. Uh, varying uh, relativistic degrees of freedom may modify significantly the transport equations to the, 
to the to the extent that the baryon number, the bow predictions for heavy neutrino masses below 100 GeV cannot be trusted. Okay, this is a strong statement. I understand that, but that's at least uh, from the computing. I mean, I rely on, to, on my other collaborators to say this, to make this statement. Uh, if you like to have uh, 10 to minus 13 and successful leptogenesis, this is what in 2 or 14, you need at least three right hand neutrinos and non trivial flavor effects. Okay, this is something we are not considered in this tri-resonant uh, scenario, but we are planning to do that. And finally, I look, uh, like to uh, optimistically say that that kind of heavy neutrinos might be able also to see signatures at the LAC or other colliders, future colliders, like FCC. Okay, uh, thank you for your attention and your passion. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, first of all, it's a nice, very nice talk. Uh, questions? Hi. So, um, thank you for the nice talk. Um, I just uh, was wondering um, um, that um, since you showed these uh, di diagrams, which are basically one to two two body DD case, right? Which which are the stand and standard diagrams. Yeah, mu to three. You mean? Sorry. Which uh, diagrams? The D case. The D case. Uh, I don't know what you are talking. This one no, or no, 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 much, much before. In the baryon, the transport equations. Yes. Yes. Okay. Ooh. This one? Yeah, here and be be before this one, yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so here, does the uh, one to three body decays also aff aff affect or they are, they are phase space suppressed? Uh, yeah, I mean, there is a paper uh, with, uh, I know, with other words in Physics Review D. Uh, you have to include uh, two to three bad decays and all that stuff. We have analyzed that. So it's a huge. Uh, type of collision terms. I see. So, uh, what was that? Uh, this is the second paper. I see. Uh, I see. Addresses okay. all that. This is, this is these dots which I left here. Okay, okay. Thank you. People use them. Yeah. But we like to do it better with uh, covariance and flavor covariance. Um, so on your uh, tri-resonant leptogenesis, uh, how do you avoid the, the um, neutrino-less double beta decay constraints and, and more importantly the corrections to the light neutrino masses? Yeah, this is what I was uh, discussing. I don't have time to, to talk about that because of the review and <laughs> all that mixed uh, <laughs> audience which is here. Uh, uh, when you have resonant leptogenesis models, uh, you know that if you have one heavy neutrino, then you really have, uh, from the heavy neutrino, uh, constraint from neutrino is double by the decay, which goes one over Mn and so on. So it has some suppression factor. So now in uh, bi-resonant or tri-resonant, I think that's also a motivation for us, um, the nearly degeneracy of the heavy neutrinos at the very low scale, the scale that the lepton... Uh, uh, the neutrinos double beta decay takes place. It's a kind of uh, gym mechanism. There is a cancellation. So you get um, uh, this contribution times the mass difference of these heavy neutrinos. Mm -hmm. You have an extra suppression factor, which is the mass difference of these heavy neutrinos divided by the heavy neutrino mass scale, which you s we are safe with that uh, limit. So, so in the case that you have two heavy neutrinos, usually that is justified with a... S slightly broken lepton number symmetry. So yeah, the, in the case thing? of the two, or uh, you have delta m n over m. I mean, this is uh, actually uh, this point was raised in the was discussed in this paper 207, well before other authors. Yeah. Uh, it was mentioned that. So if you have a three, uh, okay. Uh, you have to analyze it in a more yes. detail. We have not done that. I agree with you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, so the next speaker is uh, Jiao Liu. And she will talk about the recent results of new physics searches from Micro Moon. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you uh, for the opportunity uh, for us to present the uh, recent results from Microbone. I'm uh, uh, presenting here on behalf of the Microbone collaboration. Uh, the results will also have a focus on the new physics search. I'll start from the standard model of the uh, neutrino uh, from a experimental perspective. So in the past two decades, the oscillation experiments have shown us, painted us this picture uh, from the new disappearance or new e appearance ex uh, oscillation experiments showing the spectrum and to give us to what we know uh, as a standard model of the three neutrino uh, paradigm. Um, so all those uh, oscillation measurements give us the matrix element of the PMMS matrix. Uh, uh, with the mixing angles uh, indicated here, as well as the two mass splitting and one delta CP, uh, uh, CP evaluation phase. Um, in parallel with all those uh, oscillation experiments, uh, there were some anomaly creeping, especially in the short baseline. Uh, so that uh, anomaly consists of the LS and D, um, excess advancing in the anti new E channel. Uh, as well as the reactor anomaly, uh, the gallium anomaly, uh, as well as the mini boom uh, low edge access. Uh, there are some recent results that is showing up in the reactor anomaly, trying, uh, which is kind of suppress this anomaly channel. But at the same time, the recent results actually presented in Neutrino 2022 uh, also show some uh, results from BEST that is confirming the gallium anomaly as well. So the picture is still kind of um, blurry, um, but what I will focus on today is to address one particular anomaly, which is the Miniboom low energy access. Uh, Miniboom is an experiment located at Fermilab uh, when they measure the uh, electron neutrino appearance at the short baseline uh, located at the booster neutrino beam line. Uh, just a few words about Miniboom low energy access anomaly. Um, basically, what they're searching for is the, um, the electron uh, neutrino like uh, events that it will show up in this electron uh, excess events in the electromagnetic shower. Uh, as you can see here, this access, data access events will show up at the low energy below uh, roughly around 600 MeV, uh, between 200 to 600 MeV. Um, so, this, uh, the, their background events here is show up in the different colors but essentially you have two categories. One is those different shades of green that represents the, the final state has an electron. Um, and that could come from the electron neutrino. And the other type is this brownish yellow color here uh, is the photon channel. So, um, so Miniboom low energy access uh, anomaly has been confirmed and consistent in the past years when they update their results and it's about 4.8 uh, 4 sigma access in their new E-like uh, events at low energy. And as I already mentioned, um, in their histogram, there, there is a large photon background. And um, that is because the Miniboom detector, which is a Cranhawk detector here, uh, has their, um, does not have the capability to distinguish electrons from gammas. Uh, as you can see this in this cartoon, here is different particle type, which will show up as, uh, in, their, in their detector where both electrons and photons basically show up as a fuzzy ring here, that they, they are not able to distinguish them. The other thing I will want to point out is in this uh, box here, it's supposed to have protons, but maybe uh, being a trunk of detector, their threshold for protons is very high, so they're not able to see the uh, proton as well. Um, so in order to address the mini boom anomaly, understand what's the origin that caused that, uh, this, is, this is motivated the proposal of the micro experiment, which is the topic of my talk today. So the micro experiment, uh, since it's directly uh, targeting on uh, understanding a minimum low energy access, it is located 
uh, in the same neutrino beam line at Fermilab. As you can see here, this is the uh, Fermilab booster neutrino beam line. Uh, that neutrino goes in this ring and then goes here, and then the uh, neutrino beam is mostly uh, muon neutrino dominant beam and goes in this direction. So in this location here is, uh, and the blow up here as the drawing of the microwave detector with this uh, school bus size detector uh, is located right uh, upstream from the minivoon detector, which is located here. So essentially, uh, microvoon is also uh, on axis of Fermilab's boost neutrino beam line around uh, 500 meters baseline, and it has the same L over E as a short baseline oscillation experiment, same L over E uh, as, uh, as minivoon. Additionally, microvoon detector is also located off axis on the other uh, neutrino beam line at Fermilab. It's called Nyomi beam line, uh, which later I will mention briefly as well. Um, so, so the key point here is this microvoon is a new experiment with a different detector technology, uh, which is a liquid argon TPC detector te technology, uh, about 85 ton active volume. And so we want to use this new detector technology in order to address a anomaly that many people were not able to understand. So a few words about liquid argon TPC, uh, this new technology. Uh, essentially, so here shows a uh, drawing showing the working principle of a large TPC detector, which I will not go into the details, but the takeaway here is it provides two uh, type of detector signals, the, the scintillation light and the drift electrons. With those two type of signals, you are able to reconstruct and invent the original interactions in the detector and uh, capable of have this uh, 3D picture of the, of the uh, original interactions with the full, full pi solid angle. Um, it produces a high, so large TPC detector produces high resolution images and with the color, which, uh, show, uh, which uh, is indicating the calorimetric information of the energy loss of the particle propagate in the detector. So with both the 3D event topology as well as the calorimetric information, we're able to understand or reconstruct the original interactions with the neutrino flavor and energy very well. So earlier I showed this picture of the Trankov detector. Now it's a one-to-one -one correspondence of the large TPC images uh, that you can see that it produced those high resolution, uh, high resolution pictures that show uh, provides, uh, has the advantage of very nice uh, particle identification capability. I will say a, 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 a few more words on E gamma separation in the later slides. But one thing that uh, earlier I hinted for the uh, mini boot detector is not able to see protons, but in microbone we are able to see the proton as indicated in this very short tracks and it's highly ionized, so the color is red uh, in comparison with the uh, uh, minimum ionized particles. So um, since proposal, uh, microbone has been uh, operation smoothly uh, in the time period of 2015 to 2020 with five years of operation. It has collected the largest neutrino data set from a large TPC detector. Uh, as indicated in this graph here, that um, there are five uh, runs corresponds to this five year uh, period. Uh, and. Uh, so since the neutrino data uh, taken ended in 2020, afterwards we also have two post-operation runs that are dedicated for the large TPC detector R&D since 2021. Um, analysis results that I will show in today's talk uh, mostly use the, uh, this ha first half of period of data that corresponds to 7 times 10 to the 20 POT. Um, so earlier, I said microbone was uh, proposed in order to address the minimum wedge access anomaly. But here, uh, as the field evolved in the past decade, um, the microbone's mission really should be divided into these three uh, pillars, uh, which consist of not only the addressing the minimum wedge access and as well as some other new physics searches, but also consist of the precision measurements of uh, neutrino argon cross sections as well as pioneering the R&D effort uh, of using this uh, advanced uh, technology, liquid argon TPC. Um, so we're able, in the past uh, five years, we're able to trans transform those missions, the three pillar missions, into publications as uh, you were not able to see anything here, but just uh, showcasing uh, all our publications in this picture, uh, color-coded with different years. 
So if you want to, uh, if you are curious about all, all the detailed results, I encourage you to go to those links to see our 45 publications in the past five years, as well as the 75 over 75 public notes uh, that we're trying to communicate with the community uh, with our progress. Before I dive into the, our prior analysis for addressing low energy access, I want to first have a few, uh, couple slides just to talking about our uh, precision measurements of the neutrino argon cross-section program. Um, so, uh, so the prediction of the neutrino argon interactions at low energy, uh, rely, so far we rely on the neutrino generators, but as you can see uh, in this picture here, that at the low energy, the uh, error bars is quite big, and the, uh, those generators were not ver sufficiently verified from the experimental uh, data. So Microbones cross-section program aims to provide uh, direct data constraint of the cross-section modeling, uh, and those modelings are crucial for future new physics searches, uh, as well as the uh, oscillation experiments, such as the uh, Dune's long baseline oscillation program. Uh, we're able to do that since uh, with all the uh, data that we collect, we have over uh, half a million neutrino argon interactions. So we have a, a, a big statistic in order to have a smaller uh, uncertainty, at, especially at this low energy in this uh, shady area is where the microbone flux, neutrino flux is located. Um, so the, in our cross-section program, it basically can divide it into two types of analysis. One is the inclusive cross-section measurements, the other is the exclusive cross-section measurements, divided by the final states. So here I want to highlight two particular uh, analyses. In the inclusive channel, uh, the one I want to highlight is this new mu cc so charge current new mu interaction uh, that includes all final states in the fi uh, here, as shown here. So uh, I want to point to you this uh, uh, recent publication that we have showing um, these uh, differential, uh, double differential cross-sections of the cis inclusive measurements. Uh, because, uh, as I mentioned earlier, microwave is located uh, on a booster neutrino beamline, which is dominated by muon neutrinos. So here, uh, that's why we're measuring the new mu CC, which uh, consists of 95, over 95% 95 of the muon neutrinos. And uh, the inclusive charge current channel is also the key for any oscillation analysis. As you know, that normally for a, a new mu dominant beam, we measure uh, new mu disappearance and new E appearance. Uh, it also offers uh, the background risk constraints. So this channel also uh, providing the crucial, co crucial constraints for new physics search, such as the IE search uh, that I will present later uh, for all final states. For the exclusive cross-section, the, the one channel I want to highlight here is the NC pi zero, neutral current pi zero channel, which we can also see uh, a publication that will be, well, we're already submitted to PRD. Uh, here shows an event display uh, of an actual data event for a neutral current uh, candidate event with the pi zero decay in the final states that show, uh, manifest as two photon showers. Uh, why this channel is interesting? Because uh, it's a neutral current, so it doesn't have the charge lepton in the final state, so you have less handles in order to find out the flavor and the energy. So it's uh, not easy to uh, reconstruct. And because of all those misreconstruction, this channel, with, especially with the photon or electromagnetic shower in the final state, it's very easy to mimic as your signals if you're looking for uh, beyond standard model physics uh, that also have either electrons or photons in the final states. So this uh, measuring uh, the cross-section of this channel provides a uh, important constraint for any BSM searches that involve EM showers in the final states. As you can see here, uh, which more details, you, as again, you can uh, find in this publication, that uh, here is a uh, cross-section uh, cross measurement of the NC pi zero uh, channel. I won't go through uh, the details here, but here just to showcase all the other cross-section measurements in other channels that uh, is happening in microbone documented in this list of publications. So if you're interested, I encourage you to uh, look through them. Uh, so now back to uh, the main point of this talk, which is our recent results for the uh, low energy access analysis. Uh, this is our flagship analysis uh, that, again, because we can do this uh, to address the microbone uh, normally, it's because our, uh, the large TPC capability to separate electrons from photons. 
So for those uh, green events, which are the new E-like events, uh, uh, will show up in our detector. Looks like in the top event display here. This is uh, actual data, uh, new E can new ECC candidate, and those uh, photon backgrounds will also show up, uh, such as this. And this event is a NC pi zero uh, that uh, decay into two photons. So in, with LARTPC, we uh, commonly have two handles to separate electrons from gamma. Uh, one handle is to see in this event topology whether we have a gap or not. So if you have a gap that indicates uh, that's a photon shower, a gap between the primary neutrino vertex and the beginning of the uh, shower start. So if there is a gap, that means it's a photon. If there isn't a gap, that means it's an electron shower. The other handle is the calorimetric handle, uh, indicating the color again in these pictures. So for electrons, it's just uh, one uh, minimum ionized particles. For photons, often it will pair produce and produce the electron, uh, positron pairs. So at the beginning of the shower, it often corresponds to two minimum ionized particles. So use those uh, calorimetric information, we can also uh, separate the electrons from photons. So here is an overview of, with this capability of E-gamma separation, here is an overview of uh, how we design our first round of LE analysis. Uh, again, it has, uh, basically it has two uh, categories of analysis. One is electron-like, the other is photon-like. Uh, a lot of details uh, were also given by uh, Andrew's talk, which is, um, so uh, in his slides, uh, on Monday's parallel session at 4 p.m., you can find all the details corresponds to this analysis. Uh, but the uh, basic idea here is we want to, uh, we have two types of search of the uh, low energy access anomaly in the electron and photon channel, and we have an uh, independent analysis team as well as a procedure of the blind analysis scheme in order to minimize the uh, analyzer bias. So diving in the electron type analysis, uh, which the candidate is mostly coming from the electron neutrinos, which I also call it ELE search. Um, so diving in this analysis, as I mentioned, there are three type of uh, final state uh, topology. Uh, with the three independent uh, analysis. Um, but before we design, our uh, design the search, we first want to make sure that we have a signal model uh, so that once we have the analysis available, we want to test our anal analysis whether it's sufficient uh, to see if there is a, a anomaly appears, whether we can see that. So in order to do that, we have also developed this signal model, which is basically an empirical signal model, assuming if all the mini boom low energy access anomaly events uh, are caused by the electron neutrinos. More details of the signal model can be uh, found in this public note. Uh, the basic idea is if the, so the green here is the beam intrinsic uh, electron neutrino, and if uh, the uh, mini boom uh, access exist, it will show up as this uh, dashed red curve here. So back to our three uh, independent analysis in uh, ELE channel. So that uh, divided into the final states with one electron, one proton, one electron, n proton, where n can be zero or bigger than one, bigger or equal to than one. And then we also have the uh, electron, uh, one electron with everything else, uh, which is the inclusive channel as shown in this cartoon showing the final state uh, topo event topology. Uh, not only with the different uh, event final states, we also have different reconstruction uh, techniques. As I mentioned, Microbone is pioneering the analysis techniques of the liquid argon TPC data. So we have these, uh, developed different techniques such as using the deep learning, Pandora package as well as the wire cell package, which I won't go into the details, but it's basically different uh, analysis framework in order to reconstruct those uh, different uh, final state topology. There are advantage and disadvantage for each channel, so that's why they're all complementary. So for example, for the 1U1 proton channel, it is the simplest uh, event topology. That's why it has a lower uh, background and it has more uh, unambiguous uh, uh, energy reconstruction as well. But when you go to a higher energy, uh, the event topology becomes more and more complicated. Uh, uh, so I want to point out in this middle uh, final states, 
uh, this is the one electron with several protons, and this is identical as what Minibon is defined as their signal channel as well. So this ha can provide a direct comparison with mi Minibon. And then for the inclusive channel, uh, it has this obvious uh, advantage, which uh, it, it, it's the most sensitive channel because it's the lar largest uh, uh, signal statistics, and it's also less model dependent, and it's mostly useful for doing when it's uh, when it's a wideband uh, beam. Here showcased uh, some event displays for each uh, different uh, final states. Uh, and uh, we have uh, uh, separate publications uh, uh, documented all the details of those analysis, uh, which I just highlight the efficiency and purity for different selections of each channels. Uh, the takeaway here is showing so the bottom four plots are showing the reconstructed electro, uh, electron neutrino uh, energy. That's the takeaway here is in the low energy access region, we basically do not, uh, uh, the, the, the data observation is basically consistent as what we uh, predicted from our simulation in terms of the beam intrinsic new E events. Um, here, just to summarize the previous four spectra into one plot showing the ELE search results. Uh, so again, in each bin here is the different corresponds to different channels, and here the red line is showing the empirical mini boom low energy access uh, uh, signal models. And as you can see, our data points are basically consistent as the uh, predicted new in events. Uh, that is uh, either consistent or slight deficit even for each channels. So the, the result is showing our new E candidates events are statistically consistent with the predicted background in the LE region, low energy region. And uh, for, uh, you might notice that in this one particular channel, which is the final state has no protons. Uh, so th in this channel, the data has slight access. But I want to point out this is the least sensitive channel. And blue region here is showing that it's uh, a channel of uh, mostly background dominated. The hypothesis that new EMS are fully responsible for the medium minimum energy access is rejected uh, uh, with the 97% confidence level. And in particular, the inclusive analysis has the most sensitive results. It's showing uh, larger than three sigma uh, uh, rejection uh, in the inclusive channel. Um, so earlier, uh, a few decades ago, when, when uh, Micron was just born, uh, the motivation was to search for this EV level sterile neutrinos. Um, however, uh, as the field is evolving, the, this vanilla 3 plus 1 sterile neutrino model is, no, is less and less popular. Uh, but nevertheless, we still, it's still a, a good benchmark uh, model for us to test our sensitivity and uh, also test against our uh, results. So we did the exercise using uh, our uh, ELE analysis. So here is our uh, example of our inclusive uh, analysis channel with the reconstruct neutrino energy. Uh, and then we reinterpret this analysis to see whether, um, whether this is, uh, uh, and then did a fit uh, in, in three channels with the new mu disappearance, new e appearance, and new e disappearance. This three channel fit will be able to see uh, the exclusion curve uh, to show in the three plus one uh, parameter space in this uh, uh, mixing angle and the delta M41. So I want to point out this red line here is our uh, result using this inclusive analysis uh, with a 95% confidence level. And um, in the future, we also want to include the new me data. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Michael has both BMB and new me data, uh, which will improve our uh, 3 plus 1 exclusion curve uh, to, uh, pushing to the left corresponding to the sensitivity response to this uh, purple line. Um, beyond this inclusive analysis, we also have some other uh, ex in the inclusive, exclusive channel in order to uh, have this three plus one test in our data results. So I just told you about the effort on the ELE search in the uh, new E channel. In parallel, we also have the photon LE search. In particular, I want to emphasize here, we start with a particular photon channel, which corresponds to this delta relative, relative decay. Um, so in, in, uh, just to remind you from the minibone, this uh, master color corresponds to uh, a neutral current 
a data resonance that goes into a nucleon and a photon. So if, we, uh, if you increase this uh, background by a factor uh, three, that basically match to the shape of this access in, uh, low energy access in Minibu. This is why this is the first channel we want to uh, start to look for, see whether there's access uh, channel in this, uh, uh, access events in this particular channel. So this is uh, uh, showing the simple Feynman diagram that uh, in this delta decay, uh, radiative decay, it can put, uh, this N, big N here can be either uh, protons or neutrons. Uh, so that means uh, in our uh, data will manifest as uh, final states with either one photon, zero proton, uh, where N is the neutron, or one, uh, one photon, one proton, where N is the proton. So following this strategy, we have the uh, two search in these two final states, and this is showing our results. Uh, because this uh, event rate is uh, is very, uh, this event rate is very rare. So um, so we 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 uh, it's a background dominant channel. So we use the two photon channel in order to prov provide the constraint. And in, in this right column here is showing the the results after the constraint. Uh, to summarize the result, uh, we do not see uh, data access in this channel, and it disfavor the NC delta. Uh, that is induced by the single photon as the sole source for meaningful access. We also set the best limit uh, in this channel uh, uh, has a 50-fold improvement from the previous K T2K experiment. So, um, for, uh, so where we are now, the first LE results search uh, in the new E channel and the NC Delta channel, we do not see uh, access. That, but this means the origin of the mean access is still not known, and we have not ruled out the possibility of access in all photon-like channels. So the next immediate question we ask is, do we see access in all photon-like uh, channel? So currently we have the ongoing analysis that is uh, investigating the, what, uh, searching for the access events in the inclusive photon channel that could in, incorporate in all those other particular process, physics process. And in this public note, we have uh, documented our efforts on the selection. Uh, depends on whether we see access in the inclusive photon channels and answer those questions, you can imagine that we uh, design our follow-up investigation on the minimum low energy access in a more and more model-dependent search, as shown in this uh, final col columns here, uh, that is targeted on uh, different beyond standard model physics searches. So I don't have time to go through the details of those searches. I will encourage you to look at my colleague's Pavel's uh, talk on Monday at, 20, uh, at 4.20 for the exciting progress that we have for Beyond Sierra Model searches in microboom. The two results I want to highlight in particular is this heavy neutron lepton, uh, heavy neutron lepton search results as well as the Higgs portal scalar results which are pub published in PRD and PRL. Uh, this is my last slide, just want to show the exciting prospects in the future for the BSM searches in microbone using the nanoseconds timing. So earlier I always show about the large TPC uh, uh, particle ID uh, capabilities, but what is often not mentioned too much is about the timing of using those large TPC uh, detectors. Uh, recently we have made, made some breakthrough on uh, uh, having a nano, achieving nanoseconds timing resolution, so you can imagine for any long-lived particles which are produced at the beam target, which will fly uh, slower than the uh, nearly massless neutrinos that will arrive at the detector later. So uh, for the uh, booster neutrino beam line, we have this bunch structure, and we, we are able to use this bunch structure to, uh, to achieve background suppre suppression, especially for the neutrino background. So the prospects of uh, BSM searches in microbone and the future uh, large tpc based neutrino experiments is very good. Uh, so here is my summary. Uh, just, uh, so in this talk, I've shown you our first LE results, uh, as well as some continuous effort on investigating uh, the low energy access from Miniboom. And I also show some, uh, highlight some results from the uh, cross-section measurements, and uh, microbe will be continuously providing, uh, providing our findings uh, and uh, publish in those uh, efforts. Thank you. Thank you very much for such an informative talk. That's very good. Any questions?
Have you tried dumping down the detector so much that it looks like mini moon? That is not distinguished between electrons and photons at all, and just try to do a completely inclusive analysis to see whether you even reproduce the excess at that level? We're, well, it, it is a different experiment. So you, whatever suggestions? No, but you have more capacity, more, you can do things that they can't do, but you can just switch off all these features, right? You should be able to more or less reproduce their analysis, just, you know, look for oh, so, some so electromagnetic far, signal and uh, in the energy wind without trying to at all to distinguish, to figure out whether this is an electron or a photon or two photons or whatever. Yes. So, um, so basically, at the beginning, we designed analysis uh, in order to just look for e uh, access in the EM shower. We basically place our e, e gamma separation cutter towards the very end of the analysis. And um, if you reverse this E gamma separation cut, and then, uh, so we haven't have the published results on, on that, um, but in principle, yes, we can reverse the cut and see whether we have access there. And then, uh, but our results so far is showing in the, the two channels that we searched, we cannot reproduce uh, minimum access. Well, my first question was exactly his questions. Why? why? Because we, we still don't know if the excess at Miniboon is was there in the first place. And that was, I thought, that first question that Mike Rowan wanted to answer. But so far, that is not answered because you so haven't far done we the, have not seen access You haven't the done the inclusive research. photon analysis. Yeah. But could you show the, the neutrino appearance uh, analysis, the electron appearance analysis? Uh, the, the, the different one. plots in the different uh, final states that you analyze? No, the previous one. So, in the 1ENP uh, that is the most similar to, to... So, do you worry at, at all that uh, your data doesn't seem to, to resemble the background, or the respective background at all? Then uh, look at that, look at the green, and look at your data. So then uh, it looks quite different, right? Strikingly different. So you mean the data here? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, currently, this analysis is still statistically limited. And um, so one thing that I didn't mention too much is uh, a subtlety that we use our new MU uh, channel to constrain our new year analysis. So there are, first of all, a lot of uncertainty, especially at the low energy, for the generator to predict, predict the cross-section. But we use our data constraint to tune the, the uh, predicted um, backgrounds. So, but then you use this statistically limited thing to put strong constraints on the, on the models that, that I don't understand. Uh, we use this, so the strong uh, constraints, the three, over three sigma exclusion, is uh, the inclusive analysis, which are not statistically okay, counted. The inclusive analysis doesn't look, uh, look like a shift in the, look, look at the, 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 there seems to be a shift in the energy reconstruction, but, but anyway, so that is my view of, it. looks quite strange. Yeah, okay, so. Anyway, so I, I, uh, I just worry about, uh, I look at these uh, figures and uh, I worry a little bit about the comparison of the data yeah, so statistically, it's, we can still claim it's uh, compatible. And we are going to use our full data set. So this is, remember, half of the data set. Yes. To follow up on that, these two right plots are correlated, right? All the events in the middle right are in the right one, yeah? Um, yes, so there are some overlapping events. In principle, this, this channel should include all the events here, but because we're using, it's a completely independent analysis and different technology techniques, so uh, there are some overlap between the two. Okay, because there are some similar dips in both, but those are probably similar events. Yeah. Um, on the slide 17 on that limit plot, uh, it's great to see uh, exclusion plots now in the new recent results. So I guess it really means a lot of just, you know, this simplified model has been excluded except for some small sliver of that blue place next to the red line? Yeah, the blue place here is the LSND allowed region. And uh, the red line here, yes, basically you can claim 
So there, there is some subtlety here. Um, in, if you look at the minimum exclusion plots, they have um, the, uh, the, the fits only in the new E appearance channel. And here we have more um, fit parameters that considering all three channels. We basically uh, allow the new E appearance and new E disappearance. So that curve is somewhat different from the exclusion curve from Miniboom. So there, that's uh, that subtlety. Could you comment in that sense the difference between green and red? Yeah. The green here is um, the so the red is allow new E can disappear and new E can appear. So you have the the mix. You have two more mixing angles. For the green here is uh, artificially you only allow new E to appear. So red is the uh, red should be more correct, um, yeah, but uh, minimum is using the green. And going up on this plot is even smaller sterile neutrino masses, right? Even Sorry? larger mass splitting. If you go up on that plot, that potentially yeah. goes to smaller neutrino, sterile neutrino masses. Because that's a mass splitting, right? A bigger mass. Okay. So this thing is bigger. And the last speaker of the session is uh, Alan Faraji, and he will talk about the spinner vector duality and the Swampland. Well, thank you very much for the invitation to speak. It's a pleasure to be back. And uh, what I'll talk about uh, today is about an uh, uh, sort of alternative approach to the uh, question of uh, the relation between uh, string theory and its effective field theory limits. Uh, which is, uh, uh, so the Swampland program can be viewed as the bottom-up approach to this question, whereas what I'll uh, uh, describe today is, can be viewed as a, a top-down approach. So uh, this work uh, um, uh, is, has been done, so in particular I will talk about uh, uh, spin of vector duality, which was initially observed in a paper with uh, uh, Kostas Kunas and John Rizos, and... Uh, does this work? Right, so the uh, paper with uh, uh, Costas Kunas uh, uh, and John Rizos, uh, where we first observed the spin of vector duality and I'll uh, discuss uh, uh, work that we've been doing in uh, uh, the last two years about uh, uh, <coughs> seeing the uh, imprint of this uh, uh, spin of vector duality in the effective field theory limit of the uh, quantifications, string quantifications. Then I'll discuss, so I think that depending whether uh, uh, time will allow, I'll discuss some other uh, uh, kind of symmetries that you can see uh, from the uh, from the world sheet point of view, in the uh, effective field zero limit of string uh, uh, quantification. So uh, the the question that the Swampland uh, uh, program asks is when does an effective uh, uh, field theory model of quantum gravity have an embedding in uh, uh, ultraviolet complete string theory? So I said it can be viewed as a bottom-up approach. Uh, string theory, the, the, the feature that uh, uh, string theory has is that it has a, a, a massive spectrum, and typically uh, the, the, uh, the way this massive spectrum is ex exhibited is in different forms of dualities in which you exchange massless uh, uh, modes or massless states with, with, with massive uh, uh, states, which you cannot see in the effective field theory limit. You don't see it in the, in, in the effective theory limit a priori, uh, so the, the approach that I will describe today is how do the uh, string dualities and symmetries uh, constrain uh, uh, the low energy effective field theory limits. And, and the celebrated example of this, uh, uh, of this uh, uh, over the years has been mirror symmetry. So mirror symmetry has been initially observed in world sheet uh, uh, string computifications. 
but uh, opened up a whole new field uh, in pure mathematics that essentially dominated pure mathematics for, uh, uh, for a couple of decades. And it was a very, very profound, uh, had very, very profound implications in terms of the uh, effective field theory limit, in terms of uh, uh, Calabria quantifications. And what I will describe today is a, is a similar kind of uh, uh, symmetry. It's, in fact, it's an extension of, uh, of mirror symmetry, which is uh, uh, this spin of vector duality. And then from the world sheet point of view, there is a re these are just two mere uh, uh, examples. There's a very rich uh, uh, symmetry structure that I, I sort of uh, uh, dub as uh, uh, modular maps. And uh, uh, one particular example that, if, if I have time, I will discuss is, is uh, uh, a map between SUSY and non SUSY uh, 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 string vacua and the associated model building. So just to put it into context, uh, uh, especially in this, uh, in this forum, this conference, uh, uh, that's primarily interested in, in, in say, more phenomenological uh, 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 questions, uh, to my mind, wh whether Su SUSY is realized at, at the LHE scale is a secondary uh, uh, question. It could be realized uh, above the LHE scale. And, uh, but uh, what we have been, what we observed uh, with following LHC, the observation of the Higgs at, at uh, 125 GV, uh, it, it is compatible with supersymmetry. It is uh, the, the mechanism, the electric symmetry uh, uh, breaking mechanism is perturbative. It looks to be perturbative. W what we observe at the LHC, the, the Higgs that we see appears to be a fundamental uh, uh, scalar particle rather than composite. And, and, and to me, that's, that's the, the really the, the, the strong, uh, uh, what, what we have uh, learned with, uh, 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 so we should take from, from, from the LHC. And as I said, over, uh, especially la over the last year, uh, that if, if the Higgs turns out to be composite, I, I will uh, abandon this field. I will <coughs> abandon string theory. I will choose to do something else because uh, uh, it's very difficult to accommodate the composite Higgs in quantum field theory models, let alone in, in, in string theory models. So I, I think this is, this is really the, the, the message. And, and the standard model, since, uh, uh, since it's been invented or, or, or sort of constructed in the, in the early 70s, begs to be unified. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, raison d'etre is to be unified. I mean, we heard from Dimitri about uh, uh, the flipped SU5. And uh, uh, so th this uh, uh, fermionic uh, uh, Z2 constitute orbifold, of which the, the flipped F5 is one example, uh, it gives you a framework in which you can study uh, the, ferm the phenomenology of the style model unification in the context of uh, a, a theory that unified gravity with, with the gauge interactions. Because I think that many of the questions that we, we would like to ask, like uh, uh, fermion mass and so forth, or they say the flavor structure, we heard from Peter Linus about uh, a top-down approach to the, to the flavor structure, cannot be addressed un until you unify uh, uh, the gauge interaction with the standard model. So the, the, the fermionic Z2 called the orbifold that uh, uh, Gary Shu calls the Z2 orbifold the, the harmonic oscillator of, uh, of string quantifications, uh, has been sort of, they provide you a laboratory in which you can uh, uh, ask uh, many sort of uh, phenomenological uh, uh, questions and try to, to, to answer them. And so this has been pursued since uh, uh, the late 80s. I mean, it led to the first, uh, uh, say, model that reproduces solely the, the, the spectrum of the minimal supersymmetric standard model in the low energy effective field theory. I mean, a prediction for the top quark mass uh, uh, several years before the top quark uh, was uh, discovered at, at the right order. And then many, many other questions. In the, in the past uh, few years, we, we've been sort of looking at large classes of, uh, of uh, models with, say, with work that started with uh, uh, Kunas and Rizos, and then uh, in the last couple of years, in the last few years, uh, uh, with my students at Liverpool, uh, uh, Ben Percival and uh, uh, Victor Matthias. And it also gives you a framework to study uh, a cosmological quest question that's been pursued by the, by the Paris group. So that, again, to, to, so what the, the work that uh, I, I've been pursuing is the context of the heterotic string, but uh, you, you can uh, study the, the, the important message is not uh, uh, the theoretic string. The important message is that 
the, the structure that uh, is relevant for the, for the phenological data that we would like to describe is this structure of the Z2 cos the 2 orbifold. So you can study this, this structure from uh, using different other limits of the, of, of the uh, uh, other limits of the perturbative string theories as well as uh, uh, 11 dimensional gravity. And uh, in the last uh, few years with my student in Liverpool and uh, as well as other people, we have uh, started to look at looking at this structure in the context of uh, uh, non-supersymmetric string vacua, and in, in particular, uh, uh, non-supersymmetric string vacua that are tachyonic in 10 dimensions but are tachyon-free in, in, in uh, four dimensions. And this, this has not been looked at uh, since uh, the, the mid-80s where, where, when they've been sort of uh, uh, observed. We heard a, a, a talk this week by uh, uh, Carlo and John Antonio about s some of the features of these uh, uh, quantifications. Right, so just a little bit on the uh, fermionic construction. So uh, um, all the world sheet degrees of freedom are uh, represented in terms of uh, uh, <coughs> free fermions propagating on a string world sheet. Here the, we have five complex fermions corresponding to the GAD group. Uh, eight complex fermions corresponding to the Eden sector uh, uh, gauge groups, three complex fermions corresponding to three U1 symmetries, and then you have 12 real fermions on, on, on the left and 12 real fermions on the right that correspond to the compactified uh, uh, six-dimensional uh, uh, <coughs> coordinates, and you have uh, eight uh, uh, real fermions that correspond to the Ramon de Schwarz uh, uh, fermions. Now, when you transport these fermions around uh, uh, the non contractible loops of the torus, they pick up a phase. If, for example, if alpha is equal to, to 1, so then the, the fermions will be periodic. And then you, you, you can construct a partition function and constrain the uh, uh, constrain imposed modular environments and constrain the allowed uh, uh, transformations. And so, models in this uh, uh, formalism are uh, uh, constructed in terms of the set of basis vectors and the one-loop uh, uh, geosophases phases in the partition function. So here in, in the last, uh, so since uh, uh, 2003 with, uh, uh, Rizos and, uh, with Kunas and Rizos, we developed a systematic uh, uh, way to uh, classify large spaces of aqua. Here we, we, we fix the, the set of basis vectors, the, the notation here denotes the, the fermion that are periodic on the world sheet, so they have uh, a boundary condition equal to one. And uh, uh, here, uh, the second basis vector that I have here has uh, eight real, uh, uh, eight real uh, periodic fermions on the left side of the uh, uh, heterotic string. Th this is the, the basis vector that generates space-time supersymmetry, and I, I refer to it as, as a modular map. So whenever you add this basis vector to any other uh, uh, sector in the, in the theory, it will produce the, the super partners. So I, I refer to this uh, uh, form of uh, uh, vector uh, as a modular map. And then we have, uh, uh, here we have basis vectors that correspond to shifts in the internal uh, uh, coordinates. We have two, two basis vectors that correspond to the Z2 cos the 2 orbifold. And, uh, uh, and then you can add basis vectors that break the SO10 symmetry to some subgroup. Now, the way that the, the, the models are enumerated is by uh, uh, varying the, uh, uh, one loop, the, the phases in the one-loop partition function. So here, for example, for this set of, uh, of basis vectors, where these are Patissalam uh, 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 models, this corresponds, so you, you have uh, uh, imposing modular environments, you have 66 independent coefficients, so you have 2 to the 66 uh, distinct vacua with different spectra, so it's about 10 to the, maybe 10 to the 15 uh, uh, different uh, uh, vacua with different uh, uh, spectra and so forth, and, uh, uh, and that's the way we, we classify large, uh, we look at the properties of large spaces of, of vacua, and in particular Ben Percival over the, the past few years, he adopted uh, a, a class of uh, artificial intelligence uh, uh, programs which are called satisfiability modulo theories, so before uh, uh, using this, uh, this methodology that he, he, he adapted in this, uh, in this program, the running time, say, of uh, 10 to the 11 VACA could be 11 weeks, but using this, uh, this artificial intelligence uh, uh, programs reduces the running time by uh, uh, three orders of magnitude. 
So le let me uh, go to the, to to the issue of uh, uh, spin of vector duality. So let's start with the case of mirror symmetry. So uh, I enhance the SO10 symmetry to E6 by adding some, uh, a basis vector that uh, will give me the uh, 16 plus 16 bar that enhance the 45 to, to E6. The, uh, the mirror symmetry, what, what it does, it exchanges the Euler characteristic with its, uh, with its inverse. So it exchanges the 27, the number of 27 with 27 bar. And uh, it, it corresponds to uh, a transformation in the internal, in the uh, moduli of the internal uh, uh, manifold. So it exchanges the complex and Kähler structure moduli. Or in terms of uh, uh, Euler orbifold, it will exchange the uh, metric and the, uh, and the anti-symmetric tensor. So it's, it's a map in the internal moduli of the, uh, of the say, the, the, the theoretic string. And Waffer Witten in, in uh, uh, 1994 described the mirror uh, uh, transformation in terms of uh, uh, discrete uh, uh, symmetry that in the fermionic language I can uh, uh, realize as the, uh, uh, so the discrete torsion between the two, the two Z2 uh, uh, twist. So let me now describe the, the spin of vector duality. This was uh, initially observed with, in, in a paper with, in work with uh, uh, John Rizos and Kostas Kunas. So it's duality under exchange of the, the uh, total number of spinors of the SO10 guard group and the total number of vectors. And we initially observed this symmetry just by counting. So counting the number of, of vacua with uh, uh, two spinors or, or with two uh, uh, anti-spinors or with uh, uh, one spinner and one anti-spinner, so you just count the total number of models, and you see that this is exactly the same. This, this is a tangent uh, integer, so you, you, you add them up, and you see it's exactly the same as the total number of models with, uh, uh, with two vectorials. So that's how we initially uh, uh, sort of conjectured that there is this duality. And uh, uh, so the, the duality says that for every model with a number of 16 uh, uh, plus 16 bar and the number of 10, under, of SO10, there is this another model in which they are interchanged. And this reflects, this can be, uh, uh, this is reflected in discrete uh, uh, transformation of the GSO phases. So there is an invariance under exchange of the total number of 16 and 16 bar mm -hmm. and the total number of vectors. This is a, a, a density plot that again reflects this duality. It's symmetric under exchange of rows and columns, so it's in a much larger uh, uh, space of vacua. And the origin of this symmetry is very simple to understand if you uh, consider the enhancement to, to E6. So in the case of E6, uh, uh, the 27 is composed of a 16 of SO10 plus 10 plus 1, and the 27 bar is composed of 16 bar plus 10 plus 1, so if you count the total number of 16 plus 16 bar, it's equal to the total number of, of, uh, of vectorial. So E6, the case of E6, is a, uh, uh, is a self-dual under the spin of, spin of vector duality. So the statement is that when you break the E6 symmetry, or when you break the 2,2 world with supersymmetry to 2,0, there is a, a, a remnant of this uh, uh, discrete symmetry, which is this sp spin of vector duality. And one notable uh, point here is that there are uh, self-dual models along this diagonal that have the same number of 16 and 16 bar uh, and uh, uh, the same number of vectorials uh, without enhancement to, to E6. Let me describe this uh, uh, in terms of orbifold. So we can, we can start with the theoretic E8 cos E8 in uh, uh, four dimensions. So we have here an internal lattice. <coughs> and we uh, apply two Z2 transformation. One is the Wilson line that breaks the E8 cos E8 to S16 cos S16, and the second is, uh, is a Z2 twist in the internal, uh, uh, in the internal uh, uh, compact space. And we have here a, a single uh, uh, space twisting, so N equal 4 is broken to N equal 2, and the, we, we discuss the spin of vector duality in, in terms of SO12 rather than SO10, and uh, uh, instead of E6, we have uh, uh, E7, just because we, we are looking at the single Z2. Uh, so we, we construct the partition function. So this is a partition function. And uh, uh, the partition function will have in it uh, 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 two orbits, so two, the two orbits in the partition function. 
and there is a discrete torsion here, epsilon, and we'll have ma massless states, so <coughs> massless states will correspond to, will attach themselves to the massless modes of the internal, uh, of the internal torus, and there is a massive, the ma massive spectrum. So there is a discrete torsion that can take the values plus minus one. So you analyze the partition function, and you have these two uh, uh, projectors in terms of the, uh, in terms of the discrete, action, uh, discrete uh, uh, torsion, you see that where for epsilon equal to plus one, the massless mode of the internal torus will attach themselves to the, to the uh, vectorial state, whereas the, uh, for the uh, spinoidal state, they will be massive. So in this, this case will, be, will give you a, a massless vectorial, whereas for the opposite uh, uh, choice of the discrete torsion, the uh, massive mode will be attached to the uh, uh, vectorial, and the, ma the massless mode will be attached to the, to the spinoidal. So this is the, the, the uh, reflection or the uh, in, in inducement of the spin of vector duality in terms of the uh, discrete torsion. Now, uh, so the, this opens up a whole new world of analyzing the, the, this spin of vector duality in, in the effective uh, uh, field zero limit, and this is what we've been pursuing with uh, uh, Stefan Gutnibling and, and my student in Liverpool uh, Martin uh, Otado Heredia. So essentially, we, we looked at uh, uh, we looked at uh, orbifold. So we took orbifold that exhibited this uh, uh, spin of vector duality, and, and we resolved the, the resolution. And we showed that there is the element of this uh, uh, spin of vector duality in the in the effective field theory limit uh, uh, construction. So we looked in in in, in uh, five and six dimensions, and uh, from the point of view of the effective field theory limit, th there's no reason uh, 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 the, the computification are not constrained. So in the same way that you don't expect the, the, the mirror symmetry from the, the, the effective field theory limit point of view, the uh, uh, world of 2,0 computification, which is where we expect terminology to, to be relevant, uh, is, is not constrained. There's no reason to, to think that uh, uh, you cannot have uh, uh, examples that are not uh, uh, spin of vector dual. What you learn from the world sheet theory, from the world sheet, that the, the effective field theory will be highly constrained because you have this uh, 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 spin of vector duality. So, uh, as I said before, Waffa Witten uh, uh, showed that, uh, uh, showed that uh, you can realize this discrete torsion, the, the mirror symmetry in terms of uh, uh, discrete torsion in the Z2 equals to orbifold, and, and you can ask the same question uh, in, uh, uh, in, in the case of uh, the spin of vector duality. You can uh, look for the imprint uh, uh, of the, uh, of the, uh, uh, <coughs> of the uh, world sheet symmetries in the uh, effective field theory limits. Right, so you, you can, so since I'm, I, I won't have enough time to uh, describe everything that I, I wanted, you can just realize this uh, uh, spin of vector duality in, in terms of a modular map. So, that <coughs> so it, it's uh, uh, j just constructing a different, uh, uh, a different basis, and, and you then re realize the spin of vector duality as a, as a modular map, and then you can extend this, uh, this picture to. Uh, uh, to uh, complications with interacting internal CFT, essentially to uh, uh, more general Calabi-Aus, uh, uh, and that, that was done with uh, Panos Atanasopoulos and uh, Doron Gepner. Right, so th this uh, uh, picture of modular maps is especially rich in two dimensions. In two dimensions, there's a, 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 a field called uh, uh, Monstrous uh, uh, Moonshine, or, the, the space of symmetry in two dimensions is, is very rich, so you can, you can study this uh, uh, richness uh, uh, so in, in, in the context of this, uh, of this construction, so I'll, I'll skip this. Another uh, topic that we have been pursuing in the, uh, so with my students in Liverpool, in the last, uh, this is essentially since uh, COVID sort of began, so uh, over uh, the COVID period, you can induce a similar modular map that, so this, this is a SUSY generator that I descri described before, by, uh, uh, so this, this map adding here four 
uh, uh, periodic world sheet fermions in the Eden sector essentially takes you to a vacuum which is in 10 dimensions is tachyonic. So it's a quantification of a vacuum in 10 dimensions which is tachyonic, but then you can project out the tachyons in, in the four dimensional uh, uh, model. And then you have a map that you can take any, any model that is supersymmetric in, in, in say, in four dimensions, and you can map it to a vacuum which is uh, uh, non supersymmetric. So it's another uh, uh, application where you, you can study the uh, imprint of uh, uh, word sheet uh, uh, symmetries in, in, in the uh, uh, effective field theory limit and their implications for, for, for phenomenology. <coughs> and uh, so we have been doing uh, uh, this sort of uh, uh, classification of large, large uh, uh, spaces of aqua. And in this context, the uh, interesting question that we, we have sort of been looked at is, uh, essentially the distribution of uh, uh, the vacuum energy and uh, uh, the distribution of uh, uh, bosonic, ver massless bosonic versus, uh, uh, versus fermionic uh, states. So looking for uh, cases where you have equal uh, number of uh, bosonic and fermionic uh, uh, states. So in my last minute, um, let me describe uh, another uh, phenological uh, uh, implication that might be more of more interest to, to, to this audience, this is the case of uh, building uh, uh, Z prime, so string derived Z prime model that can, where the, uh, uh, if, if you look at it from the point of view of, uh, of the world sheet construction of this world sheet string uh, uh, quantification string models, Typically, the, the U1 that people are discussing in, say, string, in the string-inspired literature is anomalous, so it cannot remain uh, <coughs> unbroken down to low scale. So what we did with, <coughs> with John Rizos, we constructed uh, a string-derived model where this U1 is anomaly-free, and the way we did it was we took, we, we extracted, we fished out a model which is self-dual under the, uh, under the spin of vector duality. And then in that case, the, the spectrum, although it, it is, does not sit in, com in complete uh, uh, E6 representation, it, it doesn't follow E6 representation, it still sits in complete E6 representation, and the, and the U1 is, is anomaly free, so it can remain unbroken down to, to, to low scale. And then this, uh, <coughs> this gives uh, uh, so it can remain uh, uh, down to unbroken to low scale. And, and I think that uh, it, it's, it's very well motivated from, from a phenological point of view because, so we, we studied it in the context of, initially in the context of uh, 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 sterile neutrinos. And if you, if you look from the point of view of string theory, uh, st the, the, the sterile neutrinos will typically, if you look at string construction, will typically have a mass of the order of the Planck scale. There's no, there's no reason for them to remain live if, if they're not, not protected by some symmetry. So uh, the idea here is that the U1 uh, uh, under which the, the chiral is broken at uh, uh, scales that are re relatively uh, light, and then they can only obtain their masses once the, 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 this the, the, the U1 is broken. So this is motivation for the U1 to remain unbroken down to low scale from a phenological point of view. And you can extend the argument to the <coughs> to the, from, from the point of view of supersymmetric constructions to, to the Higgs doublet, namely uh, the mu parameter uh, is, it can only be generated in these models once you break the, the, the U, U1 symmetry. So this explains, uh, uh, or can explain, the, the, the existence of uh, light Higgs within uh, uh, these constructions. Okay, thank you. So I'll, I'll, I'll put... Uh, Thank you a lot for an interesting talk and to restrain to the time, which is good. <laughs> uh, any questions? Uh, thank you, Alan, for the very nice talk. Uh, could you go back, please, to the slide where you have the non-tachyonic uh, theories, please? 
This one. Uh, the this, next, this the next one. one. Yeah, this one. one. Yeah, this one. Uh, I have two questions. The first one is there is this uh, S tilde uh, basis vector in your theory. There is this S tilde, if I can see well, uh, vector yeah, yeah. in your theory, which couples the RNS fermions, uh, gives the same boundary condition to right moving fermions. Sorry? The RNS fermions on the left are coupled to the right moving fermions from the gauge bundle. And by giving them the same boundary conditions, you here, if I understand correctly, you do not have a spontaneous break, you cannot have a spontaneous break of supersymmetry. I understand correctly? Okay. Uh, and if you can go also to the next slide. Uh, no, the next one is the one with the plot. Uh, yeah, this one. Yeah. So uh, one question I have here is that in these models, you are sitting at the fermionic point, right? The what? You are sitting at the fermionic point yeah. in modular space, right? Yeah. So, uh, in this case, I presume uh, your vacuum energy is going to be very big. Of the order of the Planck scale. So, even if you set, let's say, uh, um, uh, let's say, an equal number of masses, bosons, and fermions, yeah, yeah, it's, it's still it's still large. Okay. Uh, in the landscape of models that you consider, do you uh, con uh, uh, consider models in which the fermions cannot be complexified? In other words, that there are uh, eyes, in, uh, eyes in models? You mean the asymmetric boundary? Yes. I mean, so, so that, that's something that we developed in our last paper. We, we, mm. we, we extended the classification method. You know that from the, the models in the 80s, mm -hmm. we, we had the asymmetric, they were asymmetric. Yeah, because in that case, the, the models cannot be described as Z2 cross Z2 no, yeah. or be, will not be able to be described as Z2 cross Z2 or before because you have... Pro Bosonized, I mean, they cannot be bosonized. Thank you, Alon, for this nice review. Uh, as an ignorant on, on this subject, you are going to have exotic meson, uh, vector states in your spectra or not? Uh, I mean, <laughs> exotic means non-standard model type things. Vector, vector. I mean, my question goes back to the talk we heard from Miriam yesterday, that in her compactification, she didn't have vector, uh, exotic vector uh, states. So that, that's, that, that's my question. Vector likes, yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes.
Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 